and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. I would ask everyone in the room to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent uh, and while it is possible to use mobile devices for social media purposes, uh, I would ask uh, members of the public please not to take photographs or record proceedings. The first item of the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take item six in private and all future considerations of evidence received on proposals by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to UK statutory instrument proposals. Our members so agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government using the powers under the Act in relation to the following UK statutory instrument proposals. The Human Tissue Quality and Safety for Human Application, Amendment EU Exit Regulations, the Quality and Safety of Organs Intended for Transplantation, Amendment EU Exit Regulations, and the Blood Safety and Quality Amendment EU uh, Exit Regulations. At our meeting uh, on the 23rd of October, we agreed that we would write to the UK Government to request confirmation that the Scottish Government would receive final versions of each of the statutory instruments and when they would be issued. We have received a response from Jackie Doyle Price, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Mental Health and, U and Inequalities in the UK Government, <coughs> and she has indicated that the Scottish Government received copies of the updated draft instruments for organs and tissues and cells on the 22nd of October. Her, de her letter details that final checks are being, uh, currently being undertaken and that there may be further technical modifications to draft but that no policy changes are expected. Uh, the letter advises that the latest version of the statutory instruments would be sent to the Scottish Government by the 2nd of November. We have since received a response from Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Public Health, uh, copies of which uh, members should uh, have access to. That states in his regulation, that states uh, that while the drafts of all three regulations are still being finalised by the Department of Health and Social Care in advance of being laid, the Scottish Government has now seen final drafts of all three SIs. We are therefore satisfied, that is the Scottish Government, that we have sufficient information at this stage. Um, so that's the uh, view of the Scottish Government uh, in relation to these particular items. Um, now, clearly, we, we may wish to agree uh, to, the Scot to write to the Scottish Government and to indicate that we're consent for, content for a UK statutory instrument to be given. Um, however, I think, Keith Brown, you were indicating perhaps that you would want to um, make that condition in some way or tie that to our evidence session with the Minister on Agenda Item 3. Yes, I would. Thanks, Convener. I can also just say that, um, if this is the chance to speak on it, that I, I think it is far less than satisfactory that we're being asked to consent to this, which in certain circumstances will become the law of the land without seeing final versions, even with the assurance that the Scottish Government has seen them. <laughs> this committee and this Parliament is not the Scottish Government. The, the committee and the Parliament, I think, is an obligation to satisfy itself as to the provisions of a, a legal requirement. Um, and I think it, if we agree this, then the difficulty will be that in future consideration of future items, and we are told there's lots of this to come, that will not have that. So I think in addition to that, it would be useful to have an assurance from the UK government, and I don't know who the appropriate minister would be, that we're not going to be put in this position again, that we will get to see final versions of proposed laws before we're asked to consent to them. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Yeah, Mr. Convener, I mean, I did raise concerns, particularly about the blood safety, uh, and I must concur with uh, my colleague Keith Brown in regards to that. We haven't, in this committee, seen the final version. It may be with the Scottish Government as a draft, even, but we haven't seen that, and uh, I'm quite concerned that this committee will be passing something we haven't actually seen at all. If it's the wish of the committee and the Scottish Government says it's okay. I'm happy to go along with the committee, but I do have concerns that, you know, you know, particularly the blood safety aspect of it, with what's happened in the past. Um, we don't want to get caught up in this committee of something which has passed uh, and we haven't actually seen the wording of it yet. I absolutely appreciate the point that's made. Um, I think unless there are other uh, views expressed, I, 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 we, I know we've discussed these matters previously, I think um, uh, we should... Uh, uh, 
make a determination just now about whether we accept uh, uh, the timing subject to the Minister's reply to uh, a question in the forthcoming session. I think in any case, in addition, I think we should act on Keith Brown's suggestion that we write to the UK Government uh, again uh, and seek confirmation that uh, in uh, future such legislation, start secondary legislation, that final drafts will be available uh, as a matter of course, ra and our, our final versions rather will be available as a matter of course, uh, in line with our timetable. That, after all, is the purpose of having an agreed timetable. Uh, but if, as long as the minister is um, able to assure us that he will revert to us if there is any change in the policy substance of these particular regulations, uh, then uh, if we have that assurance this morning, we should uh, agree uh, to the Scottish Government giving consent uh, uh, in line with the timetable, if that's agreeable. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, the fourth item of the agenda is a negative instrument, which is the National Health Service General Dental Services Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2018. These, are, these simply delay by a year the date of implementation uh, of electronic payments for orthodontic treatment. Uh, can I ask if members have any questions or any points they wish to make? If not, uh, are we agreed that we should make no recommendations on this instrument? Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, the next item on our agenda, my apologies. Um, yep, yeah. We are indeed, we are indeed, yep. We have skipped agenda item three, my fault. Uh, and so we will revert to agenda item three and um, deal uh, with uh, further EU legislation, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome the Minister, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing, Neil Moji, uh, who is a solicitor from the Legal Directorate, Elspeth MacDonald from Food Standards Scotland, the Head of Strategy uh, and Policy there, uh, and um, uh, to uh, address questions that the committee will have in relation to, a num again, a number of uh, uh, statutory instrument proposals from the UK Government. These are the General Food Law, the General Foodstuffs Hygiene, the Specific Foodstuffs Hygiene, the Contaminants in Food and the Quick Frozen Food, in each case EU Exit Regulations uh, 2018. Uh, can I invite the Minister uh, uh, to uh, kick off with an opening statement? Thank you, Convener, and um, good morning, and thanks for providing this opportunity to um, give further clarification as to why I am recommending that the committee should consent to these UK-wide statutory instruments applying in Scotland. As you know, the Cabinet Secretary for Government uh, Business and Constitutional Relations wrote to the conveners of the Finance and Constitution and Delegated Powers and Legislative Reform Committee on the 11th of September setting out the Scottish Government's views on EU withdrawal. That letter also said that we must respond to the UK Government's preparation for a no-deal scenario as best we can, despite the inevitable widespread damage and disruption that would cause. It is our unwelcome responsibility to ensure that devolved law continues to function on and after EU withdrawal. The rationale um, for the proposed changes that these instruments will make is to ensure the continuation of important consumer protections provided by the current EU food and feed regulatory regime. This will maintain the high standard of food and feed safety and hygiene that we currently benefit from as a member of the European Union. It's clear that the committee understands the importance of this legislation and given its complexity has understandably asked for additional information and clarification, which I have provided to you in writing. In essence, the additional information um, uh, related to, firstly, why the committee had originally only received eight days for scrutiny. This was due to the timing of the notification of the proposals from Westminster, and that coinciding with the Scottish Parliamentary recess. I'm pleased to advise, as, as I did in writing uh, yesterday, that officials have worked with their counterparts to negotiate uh, revised laying dates at Westminster, which now gives the committee its full 28 days from the original notification being made, and that's obviously very welcome. Um, secondly, the committee asked why the instruments had been categorised as Category A as opposed to Category B, um, as described in the protocol agreed between the Scottish Government and the Parliament. 
and I provided more information in response to your questions. However, um, it's fair to say that the intention of the categorisation is to be a guide to the committee and to help assist with overall prioritisation. But the committee itself is, of course, entitled to ask for evidence. Hence, we are happy to attend your meeting today. Thirdly, you asked for clarification in relation to any responsible, uh, any possible implications arising from the recent BSE case in Aberdeenshire and any impact on these proposed regulations. And I've written to confirm that these regulations are not directly related to BSE controls and there are no impacts in relation to these proposed regulations. Um, these instruments do not modify the principles or technical standards in the EU law which has served us so well, but are about ensuring its continued operat operatability should there be a no deal between the UK and the EU um, by the end of March next year, which is a situation that I'm sure you all agree we want to avoid. The EU laws which are covered uh, by these fixing instruments are concerned with general principles of food law, technical food hygiene standards and limits and levels of contamination in food. The instruments provide the mechanism by which the retained EU law in these areas might be modified in future if the, uh, and when there is considered to be required. Um, as you'll fully expect, we've ensured that the provisions within the regulations provide that any such modifications in future um, with regard to Scotland respect the devolution settlement. None of us want to find ourselves on the 29th of March 2019 leaving the EU against our will and with no deal. But we must ensure that should that happen, as a consequence of the actions of the UK Government, then there is a sound legal basis to the regulatory system for food safety to ensure that we can continue to protect public health. Um, so I hope that's, that's helpful and I hope the, the written responses were, were helpful as well. Indeed it is. Thank you very much, Minister. And uh, clearly uh, success in, in uh, encouraging the UK Government to abide by the agreed timetables and to acknowledge the importance uh, that the, of the Scottish Parliament having a different timetable uh, in terms of our own proceedings from, from the UK Parliament. So that's very welcome. Uh, is, are, are you content, Minister, that having established that uh, precedent, having uh, won that dis or uh, got the right result in that discussion, are you content that that establish establishes a positive precedent for further items of legislation of this type coming I, forward. I think we have to recognise that to some extent in terms of, of, of these orders we are um, some, uh, to some extent subject to the, the timetabling of, of Westminster so I think this may be a challenge going forward but I, I think it is very important that we continue to press the rights of, of this parliament to scrutinise these instruments um, and, I, and I, I hope that the message has got through to some extent in in, in, in Westminster. Thank you very much. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Thank morning. you for coming to see us today. Um, just wanted to ask about accountability in this and how confident uh, you are, Minister, that Food Standards Scotland has the requisite skills, competency, and preparedness to take on the functions designated by these SSIs. So, um, FSS. Um, the, the, the functions that are transferring to the FSS are, are actually quite limited and they're in line with the role of FSS as defined in the Food Standards Scotland Act 2015, uh, which set up um, Food Standards Scotland. Accountability of Food Standards Scotland um, uh, remains unchanged and, and their accountability is to this parliament, um, directly to this parliament. Okay, so on that basis, the future accountability uh, for the functions described here um, will will still we will still have the whip hand in that uh, regard. You're confident? Yes, absolutely. That? There's no 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 change to the accountability of Food Standards Scotland in, the, in that it's a, it's an unusual body because other similar bodies are accountable directly to ministers. <coughs> Food Standards Scotland is directly accountable to this Parliament. Okay, thank Very you, much. Keith Brown. Hey. Thanks, Convener, and thanks, Minister, for coming along today. Can I say that I probably don't agree with the idea that this has been a success in getting the UK Government to change the deadlines. It seems to me utterly pointless to change the deadlines if we don't actually get the detail of what's been proposed. And the briefing note which we've received says the process um, asks us to make a take a decision on legislation without actually having seen the detail of that, which I think is a a difficult position for this committee to put itself in and I would hope that the Scottish Government would support the idea that it's not just that important that Westminster complies with the timescales, takes into account the fact that we have a recess just in the same way they do, 
apart from anything else, but they actually give us the detail, and we don't have the detail. We're having to rely on what the government says it's seen from the UK government, and that is not enough, I think, for the Parliament or the committee to go on. But more particularly, can I ask about the issue of, um, as is raised in our briefing, though, of the potential for policy divergence here? And in particular, if we have policy divergence as a result, and I appreciate this only applies in relation to a no-deal scenario, policy, does that policy divergence open up the possibility, for example, that uh, either the UK government um, acting on its own can prescribe for different parts of the UK, say, for example, the acceptance of chlorinated chicken in relation to hygiene of foodstuffs, and that would then undermine any position that the Scottish Government or any other devolved administration would take in, in relation to, for example, not, not wanting to have uh, chlorinated chicken. So, going first of all to, to the fact that um, it is highly unsatisfactory, the, the, the whole process, but that was what we knew that was going to be the case, and that is why the protocol between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament was um, was formulated in the way it was, because we did expect to be in this position where we were having to um, take evidence without seeing the, the final final draft. And uh, Neil will maybe talk about that process in terms of, of, of timescales. Um, but that, that's exactly why the, the protocol was established, to make sure there was the opportunity to... Um, to have scrutiny. Clearly, if the final um, order uh, instruments which are laid um, are not um, in line with what we've been told and what we've told you as the committee, then we would have to take a view and we would either come back saying these, these orders are as we expected and that's great, we recommend you continue, or these orders are slightly different but we still think we should continue as before, or Alternatively, if there's a significant change, we might come back and say these orders that have been laid are not what we were expecting and we therefore do not recommend that um, these, are, these are approved and, and we would then have to look at what, what other mechanisms we would take. Um, in terms of um, future divergence, um, you, could, you can rest assured that I would not be in the position of recommending these to the committee if they um, effectively gave powers to the UK minister to make future divergence against the wishes of this parliament and, and, the, and the Scottish government. Um, the, the orders as we expect them to be laid would, re would respect the devolution settlement. So if in the future the UK government decides to go down the route of potentially wanting to be able to have chlorinated chicken in order perhaps to have a deal with the United States, then um, as these orders are, are, are on, the, on the face, we would be able to, to, to diverge from that and, and um, ensure that we maintained to the higher standards of the European Union. Um, one, one of the big risks here, which is not directly related to these orders, but is the, the loss of our um, access to the European Food Standards Agency, which is, I think, uh, internationally a gold standard, <coughs> not related to these um, specific instruments, but, but clearly it is something that it would be of concern if... if in the, in the case of a no-deal Brexit, we, we lost that wealth of ex expertise. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, Minister. Um, and also, I think you're quite right, in relation to the rapid... Um, i think the name of it. Uh, the rapid alert system for food and feed. I think it's also very worrying. We'll no longer be um, involved yeah. in that. So I'm not, I'm not going to ask a question about that. Just, no. You mentioned the fact that it happened withdrawing from some European norms. Going back to the point, though, about what information that we have before us, I understand the point that's made that the protocol uh, allows for this, but I would ask that, first of all, the reason for this, the reason for this is not to do with anything that the government or the parliament's done. It's because it's been so late in the day coming forward with these proposals. That's why we're now in this position. But would you not accept it cannot be right for a legislature to agree potential new laws or legislation without having sight of the detail of that, first of all? It is, is highly unsatisfactory. The whole thing is highly unsatisfactory, the whole process. But maybe, Neil, do you want to talk a little bit about the, 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 the kind of timings in terms of um, what you've seen yes, yes. Uh, in terms of the draft orders, in terms of giving me advice that I've then clearly passed on to committee? Yes, I think um, I'd say that in most cases, and certainly in the cases of these instruments before this committee, uh, the Scottish Government hasn't seen the final drafts at the point that we uh, present the, the notifications. Um, and the, the SIs are still being finalised ahead of their laying at Westminster. So um, we're trying to provide as much detail as we can in the notifications, um, taking account of the fact that the SIs are not final and are not yet in the public domain. 
but FSS, uh, official level, at the policy and legal level, are uh, we're seeing drafts from FSA at every iteration, and uh, yeah, maybe Elspeth can come in as well. Yeah, certainly. Yes, uh, so, so my team are working very closely with their counterparts in UK government, the Food Standards Agency in, in, this, uh, in this example, and um, we've got a uh, regular sight of the way that these draft instruments are developing. Um, we're obviously working very closely with our legal advisors uh, in SG. So the information that we're able to provide you is on the basis of having been uh, very closely involved in this process. And as Neil said, they're not at the stage of being completely final text yet. But uh, you know, I think we're able to provide that assurance that we've been working closely uh, with our counterparts. We've been um, our focus clearly being around ensuring that we've got our ongoing continued protection of public health and, and ensuring that we can protect the interests of this parliament and of Scottish ministers to make determinations uh, in relation to Scotland. Thank you very much. Our minister, I think you're confirming that both in relation to these items and other items, should there be changes in substance uh, after this stage, you will revert to the committee and not pr I, I, proceed. I absolutely would, would revert to you and say why we were suggesting whatever. Okay, thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Minister and officials, for coming along today. Clearly, there's a lot of vagueness in the Brexit negotiations as we speak. Uh, what we do know from today's discussion is we put through the general food law EU exit regulations, we are going to revoke EU regulation 16 2001, which sets up the rapid alert system for food and feed. Now, the Commission, as you know, Minister, has made it clear that thanks to this alert system, um, that we have averted uh, food safety problems across the whole of the EU and the EFTA countries as well. This will disappear. So we know that categorically. So what recent discussions have you had with the UK government to set up a UK-wide system to basically stop uh, problems happening uh, before it can have major uh, food safety problems in the future? You're right. This is, uh, uh, these, are, these are really significant matters um, uh, which, which have to be resolved. Clearly, the best way of resolving them would be for us to be able to remain within um, the, the EU, if not, then a Norway-style deal which, which, which would allow us to have access to all these protections. So there is still hope that we don't end up with that no-deal Brexit, but, but we have to plan for that worst-case scenario. Um, as I understand it, if, if um, there is a deal, then there would, the, 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 there would be legislation around that deal which would then withdraw these instruments and, and put us back onto a, a better, better footing. Um, but the, there is work ongoing now um, between um, FSS and Food Standards Agency to, to look at what sort of frameworks we need to put in place for March um, next year in, that, in, in the event of an no-deal Brexit, which Elspeth again can talk about. Yeah, um, clearly um, we've been working very closely with our counterparts in terms of no-deal contingency planning. So um, whilst the uh, instruments that you have in front of you today and lots of others are part of that, there's, there's a huge amount of, of operational readiness contingency planning that's also required. Um, and we recognise that in the, um, in the event of there being no deal, then loss of access to EU systems um, is something that we would clearly need to address. So we've been working with our counterparts in Food Standards uh, Agency in terms of how we... Um, could develop replacement systems or replacement arrangements whereby we would continue to get information about food safety risks um, in other parts of Europe and other member states and uh, countries that were uh, still in the EU. Um, and there are other ways by which we can uh, try to ensure that we continue to have access to that sort of information so that we can act quickly to protect the food chain. Um, but we completely recognise that loss of access to, to these systems uh, will bring significant changes to how we have to operate, but there's a mm. lot of planning going on uh, behind the scenes to, to address these points. Um, it would seem to me there is obviously lots of complexity here, but it, it's not rocket science just to replicate the European-wide model with the UK. I mean, how far down the track are we? Because it's very likely this is going to happen. I mean, is there a plan B to have a draft UK rapid alert system for food and feed? And has something recently happened about this? Well, what we uh, what, what we will still have is there are there are different layers of access to the rapid alert system for food and feed. So, as a member state, you have obviously the most detailed level of access, but there is still a public level of access that we would still be able to have as as, as the UK out with the EU. But there are other systems. For example, there, there's a um, 
There's a system called uh, Infosan, which again is, is a sort of more international system that draws information from RASIF, and I think that again will allow us to have um, time, timely and, and, and up-to-date information about food safety risks. In terms of within the e UK, we already have very close working uh, relationships across the four countries. Um, we, I think, are um, pretty efficient already at working collaboratively across the four countries in terms of dealing with any food incidents, uh, being able to ensure that we exchange information, and that operates um, pretty well at official level, and, and I don't see that being affected as, as a consequence of this. It's more just about the access fine. to the EU and the international information. So just one final question. Um, I'm not uh, disagreeing with the points you're making, but clearly what we have um, in the Rapid Alert system is a gold standard across the 28 plus the four countries uh, in, in the EU. What you're suggesting is a system lower than that. Are you able to replicate what currently happens with the other nations in the UK uh, very quickly in the basis that we withdraw with no deal from the EU? I think that is certainly the intention, but obviously until the, the, the final details of, of that contingency planning is determined, you know, I, I yeah. can't provide that assurance that it would be every bit as good. But we are withdrawing. This, so this instrument withdraws in an, us in a no deal In a no deal situation, the UK would not be able to remain within the rapid alert system for food and feed. Were there to be a negotiated settlement and a deal between the EU and the UK, that situation might be different. Okay, thank you. Do you wish to add? That's the, that's the point. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. The, the, um, the area where government has, the, the Scottish government rather, has responsibility uh, in, this, in these areas is in relation to the categorisation of instruments, and uh, that, is, uh, that falls to yourselves. Uh, in, in this case, in relation to the general food hygiene regulations and others, these appear to confer powers on ministers. Uh, therefore, the question that I think was raised with you was why the uh, categorisation of these was as category eight, uh, of a technical nature rather than category B of, of, of greater substance. I wonder if you would like to respond yeah. to that. Yeah. I think if, if, if uh, members look at the, um, the, the protocol that was agreed with the Parliament, um, category A is, is effectively technical, but also when there's not a policy change. And so while um, there are powers moving, um, these instruments don't change anything on the ground, in effect. So um, one minute before Brexit, one minute after Brexit, the, 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 the technical application of these uh, regulations would be the same. Um, and um, so that there's no policy choices within these. However, it is a, it is a call, and, and clearly this is simply guidance. So government makes our call, it's about helping prioritisation and it's absolutely appropriate for the committee. If you decide that you want to, to be more robust in your your scrutiny, then then absolutely respect the committee's right. And that, that was written into the, the protocol as well that, that the committee can make a different uh, take a different view on that. That this doesn't affect you as your your view. It's it's effectively um, aimed at helping you prioritise. Understood. Brian Whittle. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to uh, follow on Dave Stewart's point. I mean, as, as, as Dave Stewart uh, mentioned, that the European Food Standards Agency is uh, the gold standard. But given that uh, the UK have been part of uh, developing that gold standard, in fact, probably one of the key driving forces in developing that level of standard, why is it you're, we're sitting here considering that there's the potential then for it to be? Uh, 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 and even in terms of a no deal, we would have a lower standard than that when it was us that actually drove those, those standards in the first place. Um, what this, what we, what we have to recognise is that in the end, in the event of a no deal um, scenario, we may not have access to the European Food Standards Agency in the way we do just now. Mm. Um, and and to be clear, it is not just EU nations that have access to to, to the agency. So it is possible that if there's anything better than a no-deal Brexit, that we might manage to have access to that. That is the gold standard. Clearly, it is our job 
um, to, to make sure that the law works as it should, which is what these instruments are doing. But going forward, if we don't have access to the European Food Standards Agency, we need to make sure that we have something else in place to maintain those standards at the same level. Our view in the Scottish Government is that we would want to remain the standards as closely aligned to those that um, our, our European neighbours have as possible. Um, and um, so there's obviously the ongoing discussions with between FSS and FSA in order to try and make sure that we have that backstop um, of, of something. If, if we can't be part of the, of the European Food Standards Agency, we need to do something else. And so that's why those discussions are ongoing. One of the things I should um, point out is that all this work is going is, is for the worst case scenario. Clearly, I think everyone in the room here is hoping that's not where we get to. Um, a huge amount of effort being being spent to get to deal with a scenario which should have been ruled out by now. And I think that's that's the most frustrating thing, is a huge amount of this Parliament's time and the Scottish Government's time, the Food Standards Scotland's time, being used to prepare for a worst-case scenario that we all hope won't happen. I'm asking a very specific question, though, Minister, here. I'm, I'm t what I'm saying to you is that uh, the, uh, the UK have been the driving force in developing the gold standard in the European Union. Yeah. Why do you think, in a no deal, we would reduce our standards? I, I, I don't think that. I th what I think is that we are, we're going to have to work to make sure we can set something up to maintain those standards, whatever they are. Um, and that's why that work is ongoing between um, the FSA and FSS to make sure that we can maintain those standards. That has to be our, our aim. I mean, I, you know, the idea of chlorinated chicken just horrifies me. No, I, think, I think that point is understood. Um, uh, finally, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Camino. Good morning to the panel. I think it's just important to get on record to follow David Stewart and Brian Whittle's questions that actually what we're achieving is that post, and I'd like to hear from the panel, post-Brexit, that actually with regards to food standard legislation, it will be just as strong as it is currently today. And I think kind of scaremongering uh, doesn't help with that debate. Um, also, in terms of a specific point, I take it you accept that this is... Um, best to do these regulations on a UK-wide basis going forward? I, I mean, I'm, I'm recommending that these are the, these specific instruments are, are recommended um, to, to be accepted on a UK-wide basis. Um, it is important that these regulations respect the Scottish Parliament's um, place and, and the fact that these matters are devolved. Um, so any future arrangement between FSA and FSS on, on these matters um, you know, it's important that, that Scottish interests are, are, are protected in there, and, and I'm sure you'd imagine the Scottish Government will make sure that that is the case. But um, I, I do agree that um, it is important that um, we look at what we're looking at um, through clear glasses rather than through rose-tinted or some other more opaque glasses. Um, this is a, what these instruments are about, is about making sure that the law... <coughs> the day before um, Brexit withdrawal is maintained the day after. Thank you very much, Minister. I think that uh, uh, meets the questions that committee members had. Uh, I'm grateful to you for your time, and uh, we will no doubt be in touch regarding many of these instruments again in the very near future. Thank you very much. We'll suspend briefly just while the panel changes.
much, colleagues. We will uh, now resume. The next item on our agenda is the first of our public evidence sessions on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. Uh, the bill, as everyone in the room I think will know, uh, proposes to introduce a system of authorised consent uh, or deemed authorisation for organ donation in Scotland. And we have two sessions today to hear from uh, patient and public representative groups. Can I welcome to the committee uh, David McColgan, the Senior Policy and Public Affairs Manager for Devolved Nations with the British Heart Foundation, uh, Harpreet Brang, the Information and Research Hub Manager with the Children's Liver Disease Foundation, uh, and Gillian Hollis, who is attending in a personal capacity as a lung transplant recipient. Can I welcome you all to the committee and thank you very much for offering uh, to give evidence today and indeed further written evidence that uh, colleague, colleagues have seen and I know found uh, very informative indeed. Can I simply start by asking uh, members of the panel uh, what, 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 what is the need for legislative change in this area uh, and do, do you think that the, the uh, deemed authorisation under the bill will result in a marked difference in practice? Who would like to start? David? Um, first of all, thanks for inviting us to the committee. Um, it's uh, great to see this bill coming back uh, to the Scottish Parliament. Um, I think the British Heart Foundation have been pretty clear in our support for opt-out over, over the last um, several years. Um, and our, our biggest concern is the, the gap between um, the need for organs and the, and the number of organs that actually do become available. Um, I think the, the, the biggest challenge um, for anybody looking at organ donation is the, the gap between those who are willing to donate after death and those who actually do get round to donating. Um, so a number of polls have, um, ha have shown that in the UK it's around about 80% of the population would be willing to donate their organs. Um, however, in Scotland, um, only 51% of people actually get round to, to registering their wishes. Um, so that, that gap is a, is a challenge. And um, one of the other big challenges is those who um, register their willingness to donate, but actually follow through to donation. So I'm sure the committee are aware that um, family consent rates in Scotland are the lowest in the UK, um, where, um, and that's been since 2014. Um, and, and one of the challenges around that is how do we increase family consent? And I think the, the Wales experience has been uh, really crucial in that. So in Wales since 2015, when opt-out was... Um, uh, put into operation, there's been a 50% increase in family consent rates, up to around about 72% currently. So I think the, the, there's been a lot of myth around Wales, around the uh, follow-through to donation, but where we're really interested in is that family consent. Um, and I think opt-out, um, certainly soft opt-out, is, really, um, is a really good way, and the evidence is there to show that it does increase um, family consent rates. Thank you very much. Harpreet? I uh, completely agree um, with all those points. Um, and I think also with this legislation, um, it's trying to encourage people to make a choice. So it's not saying like some people, some members of the public might think that they're being forced into donating the organs of their, that um, family member. It's, giving, it's encouraging people to make a choice about it. So um, I think that that is another opportunity in terms of um, this bill. Thank you very much. Um, yep. No, carry on. <laughs> and in terms of the families that we work with, they, a lot of the families um, of the children with a liver condition say that until their child was going through um, the treatment and needed a transplant, it didn't always come into their minds that to consider organ donation. And then as soon as their child um, needed a transplant, they were registering... Um, as soon as possible. Um, so often it's the fact that people don't think about it beforehand that doesn't lead to them taking action to sign up and this sort of pushes them to make a decision either way. Thank you very much. Gillian, I know you're here in a personal capacity rather than uh, as a member of the Scottish Donation and Transplant Group, mm -hmm. so feel free and, and we're certainly interested to hear your views too. Um, I suppose, I mean, like everyone else around this table, I'm very um, pro um, any means to increase the number of organ transplants that take place each year. Um, I've seen the benefits myself. They've been 15 fantastic years. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, th I think over these 15 years, the Scottish Government, um, the NHSBT, 
um, and the NHS have, have done a lot of things to increase the number of transplants that take place. And, you know, first of all, I think we should be celebrating that and, and the, the achievements of the last of these last decade, 15 years, because there have been real inroads made. Um, opt out to me immediately after my transplant. Um, I was completely in favour of it. I thought it was a, a no-brainer. Why, why would you not? Um, I think I've been working on committees and groups associated with transplantation um, for the last six years in particular, and I've found um, that my view has changed a bit. I'm, I'm not convinced that um, moving to an opt-out system is the right means of doing it. Um, I, th I think it's far more nuanced, and I can see from the briefing note and the discussions that have come in, the comments from people, that some of these nuances and, and are things that we'll be talking about in this session. Um, yeah, yes, indeed. One, one, one particular aspect uh, of the current law, 2006 Act, and also of the bill, is that uh, neither of them formally uh, provides for family objection. Um, but uh, uh, they both are designed, I think it's fair to say, uh, in the expectation that if a family are not content, then a, a transplant will not proceed. Uh, do witnesses feel that, again, once again, not explicitly referring to that in the bill is appropriate, uh, or should there be an explicit reference in the bill to that point? Hardwick? Um I think... There might be a lot of um, backlash from not making it clear to people what that family's role is. Uh, I noticed in um, the briefing notes that um, there was discussion about families can provide information um, in regard to deemed authorisation to say whether that um, family member would have changed their mind or not agreed with the decision to take their organs. But it's not overly clear to... Um, might not be over clear to that family member what that information is that they need to provide and how to provide it. Um, and I think as long as that's made clear enough, um, then I think, and it's clear that they still have a say and they're still involved in that process, then I think the opt-out um, approach could still work. It's about changing people's perceptions of what it actually is, I think. Julian? Um, I think it's a really it's it's a hard thing, and certainly the the idea of the 2006 legislation was to try to take away that right of veto of of, of the, the the relatives. But actually, my experience of speaking to medical profession professionals on this issue is that you know if if you've got a situation where the relatives think you know I I don't want that to go ahead. Um, it's the front page of the newspaper scenario. No, none of these relatives, um, none of these doctors are going to go ahead against vehement um, reluctance or, or prohibition from the, the relatives. Um, there, um, my own experience in this was coloured somewhat by um, taking part in a um, Radio Four um, discussion a few years back, um, when and it was on opt out, and um, I went in very naive, I, I, I suppose, and very positive, and was actually quite taken aback. It was a phone-in. Um, and, and just there was a, a lot of very strong views on this, and, and relatives felt very strongly that, that they should have play a part as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a very brief supplementary article, Hamilton. Thank you very much, um, Gillian, it's remarkable to hear your story. Um, uh, my interest in this area comes from personal experience as well. My close, close childhood friend, Anders, needed a, a transplant and for the 30 years of his short life and got that, but it, it died sa sadly very shortly after because of complications. And he sort of drove my interest in this in favour of an opt-out. Um, I'm just really interested to hear about you unpack the journey as to why you were very in favour and now you're less so and, and what's caused that. Um. I think it's one of these things where, I mean, reading the transcripts of the Commons um, where the, the, the English um, bill um, was discussed last week, um, I, was, I was very struck by it. It's a really feel-good bill and, a, a, and thing to do. Um, that it feels like doing the right thing to move to an opt-out system. And I think it was only when I started looking at some of the 
um, implications and talking to some of the specialist nurses about the um, discussions that they have and, as I say, hearing some views of, of other members of public that, that got quite upset about the idea of the state having some issue over the, um, their, their body, um, control over the body in a way that... Um, it, I just realised it was so nuanced and, and not as straightforward. Um, I mean, my background, I did a law degree and, um, ironically, this was before I was ill, um, I, uh, medical jurisprudence, medical ethics was one of my subjects. So this is the kind of thing that I'd studied um, as a student and then coming <coughs> back and actually seeing it. I'm intellectually interested in it, um, but, but have a, um, just have found I'm, I'm less... Um, enthusiastic about the move to opt out than I was say 10 years ago um, and it's not because I don't believe in increasing organ donation I, I would do anything if I thought I just feel that there's a potential for a bit of a backlash Thank you very much David Stewart uh, Thank you convener um, What assessment have you made of the element of gift in the current system? Can we start with Gillian Halls because your, your submission was very interesting in that yeah. particular point I think it's it's the, the gift is something that is very important that it um, you well I mean I, I owe my life to to my donor and their their family um, and the fact it it was an active decision to to give um, organs um, the lung a lung to me a heart to um, the girl who was um, transplanted the same night as me in the same hospital whom. Um, received the heart and who I've kept in close contact with. I mean, we really appreciate that gift, and um, it, it's it's a very important part of the process for both sides. Um, and I think it's something you know. Should this bill go through, I think it's very important that that element of gift is is retained as as much as possible, um, because it it is people helping other people. Um, and, and, and that is a true gift, um, is, is a, a donation is a true gift. Um, um, sorry. Sorry, yes, sorry. Um, I think the, so the, the point on gift is really, really important. I think um, Gillian raised that in her evidence, um, as pointed out. I mean, from a British Heart Foundation point of view, we don't see moving to a soft opt-out system as removing that choice of a gift. All we, um, all we see it as is changing the initial conversation. So people will still perfectly be within the right to opt out. Um, people will actually be able to register their objections much more strongly and strong strongly and legally than than currently can. Uh, and also, we there's a reason why British Heart Foundation don't support a hard opt-out, which doesn't involve the family, compared to the soft opt-out. And I think the, the, the big part of that is maintaining that positive choice to donate rather than um, a state-sanctioned donation, which soft opt-out absolutely isn't. So we, we don't see um, the, the concept of gift being removed through soft opt-out. We just see it changing the initial conversation at the start. Uh, in a conversation that I recently had with one of our Scottish families, um, that was the idea of a gift was something that she explicitly said. She was completely, the mother was completely in support of a soft opt out um, approach. Um, but she said when her daughter received a split liver transplant, she said they were ecstatic because if they hadn't received it at that time, then their daughter wouldn't be alive right now. But then she remembered that for her daughter to get that the transplant someone else has passed away and they did see it as a gift the fact that someone chose to donate that liver um, and she said she would feel slightly more uncomfortable about it if she knew that it wasn't a choice that they made um, actively but looking at the soft opt-out approach it, people are still given a choice um, but it is the idea of a gift I think does still need to be retained in terms like um, Gillian said from mm. both sides. Mm. Thank, thank you for that. And how important is simplicity of message uh, in the bill? Again, to quote from Gillian Hulse's uh, submission, uh, and I quote, she said that it's a quite a complicated language. Tell us if you want to donate. Tell us if you don't want to donate. And if you don't tell us anything, we'll presume you've got authorised donation. That, as a layman, seems complicated to me. <laughs> uh, Gillian Hulse? Um, yeah, I mean, that's something I, I do feel 
um, just from talking to people, as it's a, you know, there, there's work going on about the opt out tip bill, and people say, "Oh, I thought that had gone through already." Or you know, it's it's people are not aware generally of of, of what's um, what's happening. It's a complex, and I do think it's a complicated message. Um, I think, I mean, some of the terminology doesn't help. Deemed authorization is is quite obscure. Um, opt out, opt in. I think, as I said in the submission, there's lots of double negatives possible there, and I, so I think it, it's it's going to be challenging. Um, but but it's very important that the message is clear, um, because say we're we're all of us wanting to do a good thing, and we need to make sure that we um, convey that message. Um, as, as positively as possible, but as simply as possible, so we get it across. Especially when you are moving to a default position, um, where um, we're saying that the, the, the organs would go to donation anyway. Um, so I think it has to be simple. So I think the, the interesting thing about the opt-in and opt-out, and we had this debate when Anne McTaggart brought our members bill forward, but... We, we kind of defaulted to Wales where there was actually quite a movement during the, the government legislation to retain the opt-in. So the original Welsh government legislation was going to get rid of the opportunity to opt-in. Um, but many people still want to make that positive choice uh, while they're alive and many people are quite proud of carrying an organ donor card and that, and that was one of the reasons why we retained the opt-in. Um, I don't dispute um, Gillian's um, point around confusion around that, but We've got to look at organ donation campaigns that have happened up until now. None of them have spoke about opt-out. None of them have spoke about any of the, the messaging we're hearing. Actually, if we learn from the Welsh experience where they had an 18-month um, campaign, um, the vast majority, I mean, it was over 80% of the population understood the legislation. Um, I mean, there's not much legislation that comes out of Scottish Parliament that, that has that level of understanding. And I think um, what we've got to, to really, and, and one of the reasons why BHF really likes this bill is Compared to the English bill, for example, there is a duty on ministers to communicate the, the legislation, and that will be very, very important in the, in the run-up to that. Um, so I think um, while the legislation may be confusing right now, um, and 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 that that can be said for for any piece of legislation, it will be about how the communication from Scottish government comes out following the, uh, if the bill is successfully passed. Yes, just just a, a quick supplementary, really. Um, just to say, we are unusual in Scotland in having um, the money devoted to organ donation campaigns um, that we've you know, had over the past few years. And you know, obviously, I think all of us re really appreciate that. I think that's made a huge difference, um, both in, in getting the um, number of people on the organ donor register higher in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. So you know, it's against that background of of getting money for campaigns and having good campaigns. So, you know, I really appreciate that. Harpy, did you want to add anything? Um, just that in terms of the bill being made very, very simple, in, because this is an opportunity to shift people's attitudes as well and perceptions and the culture uh, surrounding organ donation. So the more simple you can make it the and the more efforts and investment you put in raising awareness. And it does need to be very, very simple. Um, then the greater the well, the more effective I think this will be in increasing the number of organ donations. Much. Yeah, and my, my final point, uh, con convener, a very general point. What's your assessment of uh, the issue of deemed authorisation? Will that increase donation rates and subsequently save lives? Um, just to reiterate my uh, my introduction, I think um, so. Um, Nine out of ten countries um, across the world, um, or the top ten countries across the world uh, uh, in terms of donation rates, nine of them use an opt-out system. The only one that doesn't is the United States. Um, but also, um, when we did this bill a, a few years ago, many people wanted to see what happened in Wales because it's a similar healthcare system and, 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 and a similar culture. And, and I think... Um, the, the evidence there has shown that um, there's been a significant increase in family consent rates. Um, one of the points that Gillian touched on earlier was the special nurse, specialist nurses. Um, and in Young et al's um, uh, analysis of the Welsh experience, they said that specialist nurses found conversation to be much easier and families to be much more informed. Um, I think one of the things that Wales has been a bit of a, um, a smoke and mirrors in Wales is that 
organ donation rates haven't increased massively, so they estimated 20%. Um, but um, in um, Madden's um, analysis of the legislation, they put that down to eligibility of donors. So we, we, don't, we can't predict how eligible certain people will be for donors, but what we can try and shift is that family consent rate, which is fa um, countries that have got high donation rates have high, high family consent rates. So yes, Scotland's got the highest percentage of the population opted in already, um, but we are the lowest in terms of family consent rate. And I think that's where we really need to move the, uh, move the culture. Now. And we do, uh, at the BHF, believe from international experience and in the Welsh example that family consent rates can shift using opt-out. Emma Harper. Just to pick up again about the, the number of donation rates increasing. So I guess first I need to remind everybody that I'm a former member of the liver transplant team when I worked in Los Angeles. So um, just to remind folk that. But I'm interested in the increase in donation rates. It's about a cultural sh change. And you've alluded to that because there's no single measure will increase the number of donors that we have. So and... You've already said that the, the, in the bill the government have a duty to communicate to people. So um, how would you expect that communication to, to be delivered? Yeah, so, um, so I think, as I said earlier, I think we can... Uh, I mean, the Welsh... Um, the lead-up to the implementation of the legislation in Wales um, was, a, a, I think it was an 18-month... Um, communication campaign which was highly effective um, I mean one of the other things that's interesting in Wales is the increase in people who have decided to opt in since they brought out the opt out legislation so more people have got round, uh, round to doing it but the, I think communication is key I think um, the, the Welsh government used a, a whole multi-channel um, approach so they did uh, TV adverts, bus stop adverts, had a great radio campaign. Um, there, there was a whole um, raft of um, literature that was um, used by the NHS and organisations like the BHL, BHF in Wales. Um, and I think it, what we've got to understand is that we, we live in a multicultural, multilingual Scotland and we need to make sure that any legislation, any campaign is, is really targeted at all communities in Scotland. So um, I think the, the Seven Words to Save Seven Lives campaign that the Scottish Government ran recently was, was really, really good. And, and the Scottish Government have clearly got um, something that's working for them in terms of getting people to opt in. Um, what we now need to look at is how we move the family consent. And I think um, any sustained campaign or organisation is going to, going to be effective um, given the experience the Scottish Government's had um, historically. Um, I think deemed authorisation on its own might it doesn't necessarily mean that organ donation rates are going to increase. It it's all about taking a holistic approach to it, and that could be in terms of start, starting with the communications to the public as soon as possible. Um, and for example, like I mentioned earlier, many of our families don't actually join the organ donation register until they're actually affected by it or understand what it's there for um, so it might be a, a surrounding um, sort of promoting and showing people the lives that it affects and how it affects them and how it can save lives um, because a lot of people especially in certain cultures don't like to talk about death and they don't like to think about that stage of their life um, and I think trying to start that communication as early as possible with certain um, groups as well, even older generations. Certain older generations don't like to talk about that stage because of the um, fear of it. Um, so I think it's about being able to talk about it more openly um, and the language used and um, the roots, for example, in not always being through online portals, um, through different... Um, routes of communication. Julia? I think it is a continuation of what's going on at the moment, which has been a, um, an increasing acceptance of talking about organ donation publicly. Um, in, both in hospitals, um, there's a sort of the, the whole hospital approach where all the um, staff, um, whatever their department, are encouraged to think about it rather than just um, the, the areas that are dealing with um, intensive care or, or um, accident emergency um, and there's also been a bit of a shift I think to trying to get discussions about organ donation as part of the, the or 
the usual part of end of life care as well, um, which has is, is been quite important. But that's they're sort of again sm smaller cultural changes that will make a difference. Um, the more regular campaign that's ongoing with educating and that's starting at school age and, and up, I think is, is very positive and very helpful. No, that's good. No, thank you. Uh, Miles Briggs. Yeah, can I just come in on um, Emma Harper's question? Because I noticed from the evidence that countries who already have um, soft opt tapes, such as Israel, Belgium, Norway, Spain and Sweden, um, obviously have higher rates. And specifically with regards to Spain, they introduced their system in 1979. I just wondered if there's any evidence of what they've done differently or has that been a cultural shift over time as well? I mean, I think suspect that you'll um, have a bit more information on Spain because it is very much held up as the model of organ donation, how to get organ donation rates up. Um, again, if you, if you look more closely at the figures, um, they brought in opt-out, um, but it was only 10 years after bringing in opt-out that they really saw a big difference, um, a big increase, and that was due to um, what, what we could say infrastructure changes so bringing in the, the way that their organ their teams were organized um, the availability of retrieval teams operating theaters public aware there was there were a lot of things that went on there um, so I, th I think it's um, it I, I think we've all in our submissions talked about the raft of different proposals and different infrastructure things that have to come in at the same time to make a difference um, in in the organ donation rate. Um, so I think um, in international um, evidence, there's, 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 a, there's a whole range of different opt-out systems, if you would. I mean, the, um, every country that runs opt-out has brought the legislation in, um, which is which is one of the three pillars that we look at as the BHF. So pillar number one is legislation, opt-out legislation. Number two is continued infra infrastructure investment. Um, so if you look at some of the countries that run opt-out, um, uh, some of the highest availability of ICU beds uh, um, in the country, which is really important. Um, and then also um, staff training is pillar three, so that continued investment. Um, Spain is a really good example. They brought in legislation 79. They didn't create a national coordinating body till 89. And they then ran a really big media campaign in the early 90s, and that's when you really started to see the climb. Um, and I think that, that it's, it's that kind of... Um, I think it was um, Harpreet that said that, that you know it's not the silver bullet this legislation, but it's actually a part of a whole package. So um, we need to continue investment, we need to continue training staff, um, and and then start that cultural um, uh, change within Scotland. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Right. Hey, can I thank the panel for the evidence and for coming along today, and in particular to uh, Julian Hollis? I thought your evidence was yeah. great in terms of its clarity and its brevity. <laughs> and also very much agree with your point about it being complicated, the message that we're trying to put forward. But also your other point about how well things have been done over the last 15 years and the fact that we're doing so, the dedicated resource that you talked about. My particular interest, though, is in relation again to something that you mentioned about the, the rights of the individual. If somebody, an adult, um, takes a decision that they want to donate, um, what rights do you think that other family members have to override that? And I suppose the related issue is, in presumed consent or deemed consent, what right does the state have to say that we will take control of your body to that extent unless you've expressed a wish otherwise? And I suppose a little bit added to that is, is there a danger if we continue to allow family overrides that that's more likely to happen in a situation where they're trying to override a deemed consent than it is an explicit consent? Mm -hmm. Who would like to start? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's actually um, the nub of, of the, the really difficult issue, because, and it's something where you're not going to get consensus on, on these points, um, because under our existing system, and when we first talked about um, the, the 2006 legislation that did allow, um, in theory, um, doctors to override um, the uh, relatives' consent. Um, there were still a lot of people who were who were saying, you know, we we don't want that. There, there's very strong views on both sides, both from you know, if I make a decision, I want that decision 
to be carried out. I don't want my relative to be able to do that versus the relative on the day at, at this bedside saying, you're not going to take the organs um, away from, from my loved one. It's, it's, it, it's very personal. And um, I, I, I'd probably sit on the fence a bit with both. I, I'm not sure what the correct answer there is. Harper? Um, I think it's a difficult situation, as Gillian said, because family members are, if they have a very strong opinion, that they might see this as a bit of a um, the state taking control in a way. But again, I think that comes back to educating them. Um, it's yeah, it's a um, it's a difficult one to. It's a matter of opinion on um, how people perceive it. Um, and I think it's also about the staff that they're dealing with, the medical professionals they're dealing with at that time as well. I think if the training that they have um, should be a sort of cohesive, collaborative approach with the family members, and I think that might um, ease this sort of tension up a, a little bit in some way. Um, but I think it will always be there. Thank you. David? Yeah, I think... Um Reiterating what Gillian said, our experience of working with clinicians on this is that you know no clinician is ever going to go against family a uh, family's wishes. Uh, uh, I mean, as uh, you know, we might have been speaking to the same person, but the the front page of the newspaper um, analogy was given to me that if a family said no and they said, well, the law says we can do it, um, and, and that's just never going to happen. But I think the the the, the interesting part in this for me around um, deemed consent, state ownership, um, you know, right of the individual is that. Um, the family's decision uh, and the family's role in the whole process is made significantly easier when the wishes of the individual is known. So we know that people, uh, families are less likely um, to object to donation if they know their loved one wanted to donate. Um, and I think the same would be the, the, the flip if they, if they knew their um, family member had opted out. I think the family role becomes much easier and just to confirm that their their family's wishes. Now, you know, I've met um, through the consultation on, on Anne McTaggart's bill, we met families where the children really, you know, were all for organ donation, but the parents said, I, would, I wouldn't do it. Um, and you know that that that's a really um, challenging conversation to have as a um, as a family. But I think what we want to do through Opt Out is to make that conversation easier, make those conversations more likely. And and I think it really does start to take out that um, legalese challenge of state ownership because the family um, really understand their role within it. And and I'm not sure that's in the current system is quite understood how how often the family are involved. From my reading of the bill, this doesn't make the family's role any clearer, what's proposed. There's nothing explicit in the bill I can see about the role of the family. I'm really interested in what you think allows the rights or the views of the family to supersede the expressed wish of the potential donor, either not to donate or to donate. I understand the point you make about medical professionals. Perhaps that'd be easier if it was in law what the position was. Um, but what, what is your understanding of what gives the family that right. Obviously, there's the family nature, but if, if that person has made a decision, and the other point I, I tried to make was, if if this goes ahead as planned, is it not likely to be the case that families, if they get this continued, non-legally acknowledged right, are they not more likely to challenge it when it's a deemed consent than they would do if somebody explicitly consented to it, if you know what I mean? Thinking, well, you know, he or she never agreed to this. It's just because it's a law, and that's I'm going to object to it for that reason. So, so what? 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 Why does the family? Where do the family's rights derive from? And is this not going to be counterproductive in terms of family veto? David. So I think in the I think in the the point about deemed consent, um, if someone hadn't opted in or opted out, the the legislation is very clear that they are in if in to donate. Um, so they've not made the explicit statement of, I don't want to donate. Unless they'd said to their family members, look, I, I don't want to donate, but I've never got round to opting out. Um, and, and, and that's... Um, you know, th th those those cases are written in. Um, I mean, I, I, I completely share the... The, the challenge around um, where does the family have a right to overrule. So I, you know, if someone has opted out, then I, I, I you know... 
we, we would see it as that person is out and the family shouldn't be overriding their, their decisions. Um, and the same as someone's opted in, but we do know that already happens. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, uh, you know, I would never want to find myself in a position where I have to make that decision to donate someone's organs, um, if they, and even if they're adopted in or out, because it's a high-stress situation. And I would come back to, I think it was Gillian's point around um, effectively training staff to have those conversations. Um, and I, I, So I think... Um, there, I think there will always be cases where family members will um, feel they want to go against the wish of their loved one. Now, whether the parliament wants to decide whether they make that uh, um, not, not possible to do or not, um, BHF doesn't really have a view on that. Um, and I think you'd probably find there, there's views on both sides of the aisle there when uh, you're going through the evidence sessions or, or publicly as well. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Brian Whittle. To Pal, I just want to pick up on, on uh, something you said there, David, around a healthcare professional will never go against the will, uh, the will of the family. I think that's a dangerous statement to say um, because I don't agree with it. Uh, I, I also don't think that we should be putting those kind of decisions onto healthcare professionals. And I think probably to Keith Brown's point, do you not agree that it, 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 if we could bring this bill forward, it must have absolute clarity? so that there's no wriggle room there. So we're not putting those kind of decisions on healthcare professionals because I, I'm not convinced of your argument there. So I think um, the, the point on healthcare professionals is, is purely anecdotal, so I've not, I've not um, polled all, all healthcare professionals, but it's a very common uh, message that's given to us. And it's a message that, that we, we wrangle with when we're looking at the, this legislation and topic. Um, on the um, second, on the, the point about the clarity of the bill, the clearer a bill, the better for, for me and for, for everyone, I think. And I think that the, the panels um, said that. I think the, the, the less complicated this is, the better. The easier it is to communicate, the better. And, and I think that's important to bringing that, uh, bringing that through. Um, but what, um, you know, we do have instances at the minute where, um, and I, I don't have the figures to hand, but there, uh, you know, it's is only in the kind of five, six, seven, eight um uh, cases where families have objected to their loved one donating even though they've opted in so I think what's interesting is to go back and look at, understand what those conversations were like and why under the current legislation the clinicians didn't say well we have the right to do this because your loved one's opted in under the current legislation so I think um, you know, the, it's interesting to go back and look at you know, why that's happening right now why it still happens um, and, and what percentage of donations are where clinicians say we're going to do it. I mean, I think you find it be very, very small. Again, I don't have any evidence to back that. Um, and we do have our, our, you know, our Welsh colleagues who have been running the system for two years now. And I think um, I'm not sure if the committee is going to be hearing from from anyone, but I think they they will have a wealth of experience already in two years about how those conversations have gone and, and what it's like. Julian. I mean, I I think there that's where what what the bill is proposing is a very big change in the default position. So the, 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 the deemed authorization, if you've not recorded a yes opt-in or a yes or, or no opt-out. Um, and in, that has to be made clear to people before you can then enforce um, the, the, the fact that um, it, will, it will be deemed and that's what's going to happen and, and relatives should not be able to override that. Um, so, again, it, you know, it, it, it's something in the bill that is, is a very big change and will need to be um, communicated. Um, and if it's communicated properly, then it will be all right to, to be able to override the... or, or not to accept um, relative overrides. But, um. uh, I think it comes back to, again, where it talks about relatives need to provide evidence or information I think being very clear about what that is will make not easier but a little bit more um, clarification for the professionals involved in that process um, because I think at the moment it, that might not necessarily be clear it will be just interpretation very much. Alec Colham. 
Thank you very much, convener. Um, I would like to ask about um, the, the family override again. Um, and it struck me that when we took our informal evidence uh, session with the um, specialist nurses who were talking us through the process by which that conversation happens currently, that they were... Um, revealed to us that there are literally hundreds of questions that are asked to families um, at the most difficult time when they are just coming to terms with the sometimes very sudden loss of a loved one um, and that that was a, a demonstrable deterrent to families for, from allowing consent because they, they would sometimes or, or often bail on that process because it just became too long and too drawn out and they needed to collect themselves. Um, can we do something with this bill to reduce that, um, that bureaucratic pressure? Um, or are we going to, um, by necessity, create further bureaucracy in this process? Who would like to start? Julian Hollis? Um, you're absolutely right that my understanding from the specialist nurses is that, um, and from reading papers on why donations did not go ahead, um, the length of time um, in the process and the amount of questions and bureaucracy that had to be answered was one of the, the very big factors behind that. And I know um, my, um, my husband's cousin's husband died in a motorcycle accident and she was um, went through the donation process um, uh, uh, with her husband and um, said she was, just, and this is now 15 years ago, she was horrified at the number of questions she had to go through. And she said, you know, quite frankly, I got to, you know, halfway down the first page and I said, I can't do any more of this because, you know, just as, as you point out, the circumstances are so difficult. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which this bureaucracy is us having a better understanding of... Um, of what can and can't be transplanted and, and that, you know, we now can do more um, and can transplant more organs. And I'm not sure if it's if the extra bureaucracy is an essential thing, but I, I would certainly welcome anything that, that um, uh, reduced that. Um, I mean, interestingly, from a patient recipient point of view, the, the, the forms that we're being asked to sign now um, are a lot um, more bureaucratic and longer than ever. I just signed a one-page thing saying, you know, I will accept any, any organ and the risks that come with it. Um, now, um, people that go on the transplant list are being asked to sign um, met pages of forms and, and the different types of donors and different risks that might associate with each of them. You know, it's a very difficult position. Um, so I, I don't know how much of that bureaucracy, <coughs> excuse me, is necessary, but if it can be reduced, I'd, I'd welcome that. Okay. Any other any other witnesses have a view on that question? Uh, from, from our point of view, I think it's anything that's clinically safe. So I think we need to. Um, I mean, BHF wouldn't have an opinion on this, but I think anything that makes um, makes a process easier for families um, and and. Um, uh, streamlined um, as long as it's still clinically and medically safe and I think it would be deferring to our specialist nurse colleagues who, who operate that. If I may, with just a brief supplementary convener, because um, we were told by the specialist nurses that this very much mirrors the sort of questions you answer when you're donating blood um, and I understand that. There's a, a, you know, a need for clinical surety about the, the what's coming in but obviously that's not done in isolation. With blood, as with organs, there are tests done to just check that that it is clean, that there's nothing, no contaminants, no diseases. Um, but also we're asking very vulnerable uh, families very intimate questions, which they may not actually be able to tell you the accurate answer on. They, you know, if, there's, uh, if it's about sexually transmitted disease or lifestyle factors, it may be that they don't want to reveal that that was a, a something going on in their family member's life, or they may not know. So I don't think there's actually that much surety you could derive at that time and I just wonder if we can actually dispense with part of that to give them that comfort to, to give them that respite from quite an arduous questioning and, and just wondered what you thought about that whether it was still clinically necessary to probe those areas Anyone have a view? Gillian? Wearing another hat I sit on um, an advisory committee um, SABTO um, which is um, advises the um, UK and devolved governments on matters to do with the safety of blood, tissues and organs for transplant. And we are doing quite a lot of work in that group to increase organ donation by um, looking at um, organs fr from people who might be 
have previously been considered too high risk or the particular organs might have a, a, a particular risks attached to them. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work on categorising different risks and, and how these organs might be utilised safely. Um, so um, that's been, um, or is being very successful in increasing the number of organs that are becoming available and can be used for transplant and increasing the number of transplants. So there is a balance there between um, making sure that we are um, getting the safety part right um, but not um, doing things that um, mean it's far more difficult for the r relatives um, to say yes to organ donation in the first place. Um, okay. um, I think absolutely. If there's any, I think this, if this can be used as an opportunity to cut down the, on the bureaucracy and the number of questions that people have been asked at such a difficult and sensitive time, then that's fantastic. We can't really comment on how clinically safe it is because. We're not medical professionals at Children's Liver Disease Foundation, but if there is that opportunity, I think with this um, bill, it might be the ideal time to consider it. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra White. Just a, a small follow-up, and Gillian sort of answered some of my questions. Obviously, you're involved in that, but I just wondered what organisation or groups have any of them at all been asked about the questions? Have they been consulted? Do you think part of this bill should be? a consultation, because Alex Cole Hamilton is absolutely right. Some of the questions that were asked were so intimate uh, at that particular time that the people didn't know anything about it. So do you think that should be part of the bill? That we should be looking at reducing the questions? Should it go out to consultation? Or should organisations such as yourselves be asked exactly what? Because I felt it was 300 questions, I think it was, at that, a time like that. Absolutely. I think and we're all about advocating patients' voice and um, speaking on behalf of the public and getting their opinions and views on things because at the end of the day it's affecting them. So, um, for example, if you speak to the family members who might potentially be asked these questions, you can derive from them what the most sensitive questions are and then work alongside the medical professionals who know which one's absolutely necessary. So I think it's a, you have to involve a lot of different stakeholders in that to come to the right in between and the right level of... Thanks. Um, yeah. David? Um, I suppose my maybe question back to you, Sandra, is, it, is it, do we need legislation for that? those questions to be written or is that a recommendation that can be made to NHSBT to look at Because what we've got to remember is um, organ donation isn't Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland. It's a UK-wide framework. So we would need to work with colleagues across the UK to understand what questions are um, would be appropriate across the UK and, and understand that and uh, the, the current setup. So I think um, I, I think it, I, I couldn't speak from experience when it was last reviewed, but I think it's something worth looking at. Um, but certainly, if it's something the committee's identified, and, and I know it was something that was identified a number of years ago um, when a former MSP spoke about his personal experience. So I think um, I, I, th I think it would be something that'd be worth doing, and I think. Um, Harpreet's absolutely right. Patient involvement, uh, families have went through the process. Um, the, 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 that kind of framework to to bring the best answer would would certainly be worthwhile doing. Okay, Julie. Yeah, and that, that recommendation I think would go then to the NHSBT, who are the the people that are dealing with that and doing the questions. Um, and um, yes, as David says, doing it on a UK wide basis. It's clearly it's it's not just in Scotland, um, but I think that if if um, there, yeah, I, I agree with David. It, it's not probably part of the legislation, but it, it, it's something that if a strong recommendation was made at that mm. point to review. Um, okay. Having said that, I do believe it's being reviewed in, in HSBT because it is being seen as a hurdle to, mm. to increasing donor numbers. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Uh, David Torrance. Convener and good morning, panel. In Wales, deemed consent applies to people at age 18 and over. In Scotland, uh, deemed authorisation will apply to people aged 16 and over. Do you agree with 16 being the age at which deemed authorisation should apply? David? So we, we're we happy with 16. Um, we, we looked at this when the, the previous bill was going through and we looked at the legal age of consent in Scotland. So it differs from the, the rest of the UK and that's why we are, um, we're, we're happy with 16. Um, However, it's you know if, if the 
consensus was to move it to 18. I'd, uh, BHF wouldn't have any major opposition to that, but um, uh, the previous um, age was set just to tie in with age of legal consent. Any other views? Okay, David, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, the reason I asked that question is 16 and under is a very hard group sometimes to engage with. So how can we provide sufficient opportunity for young people to express their wishes um, on advancing reaching age 16? Sorry. Yes, please. Um, um, I think this is something that um, the education in schools um, can be part of. I mean, I've done quite a lot of talks in schools, um, sometimes as part of the curriculum, looking at the um, uh, personal social responsibility. And, and um, so some, of the, some pe pupils are covering it, and hopefully a, a lot of them are. The first thing I stress when I go in is I'm not here to convince you all to sign up to the organ donor register. That's not what I'm here for. But I'm here, one of the things I do want you to do is go home tonight, discuss with your families, and, and find out what each of you, um, what their views are. Um, so I think it can start early, and it probably does have a place in the, in the school curriculum to discuss organ donation. Um, okay. uh, I completely agree that I think that discussion can start uh, within schools in the school environment and the earlier it starts the better almost because like Gillian said they'll a lot of school children will go home and discuss that with families um, so you're targeting family members as well as the children and educating people at a very early stage so that that culture change can happen from that age range. Okay thank you very much. I'll keep Brown brief supplement. Brief points uh, given the, the the point that David made before about the UK operating um, as one in relation to this, if it was to be passed at the point that David Torrance made in Scotland it was 16, does that introduce legal complications for where organs can then go in the UK? That's a good question to which there is no immediate answer. Uh, yeah. Completely stumped there. Yeah. Um, as somebody who um, uh, lives in Scotland and um, but had my transplant in uh, England, um, because uh, the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle is the nearest lung transplant centre. Um, and I, th I think my, um, my lung came from another part of the UK, um, not England, not Scotland. Um, so I, I don't know the, mm. the ins and outs of how that would work. My understanding of the Welsh system at the minute, so obviously we've got two systems that operate in the UK. We've got a soft opt-out in Wales and then the, the, the opt-in across the rest of the UK. Is, um, and as someone who's a frequent traveller to Cardiff, I like to keep a note on this, but the, um, there's a residency period in um, the Welsh legislation. I believe in the Scottish legislation, it's a year as well before it applies to you. Um, you, if if, I, if something was to happen to me in, in Wales, I would not be treated under the opt-out system, I'd be treated under the opt-in system. Um, so I, I'd imagine there's precedence there for um, an English family visiting Scotland and, and someone was under 18, that they, they, would, they, would, they wouldn't default to the 16, it would be the 18 which would be operated across the rest of the UK. Um, unless they decided to, to lower it as well. So I think there's precedence there for us to, to have a look at how Wales operate their system. So can you just, it's more the case of, say, a 16-year-old in Scotland and was a donor. Is there a restriction then on where those organs can go within the UK, given the presumption it must be 18 years old and over elsewhere? I have a feeling that's maybe a question we'll have to put to the government um, in due course. Uh, Sandra White. Uh, pre thank, pre thank, pre thank you. Pardon. Uh, I wanted to touch on uh, an issue of the pre-death <coughs> procedures. Uh, it's something that uh, caused great concern uh, when we were talking to uh, individuals and we had the private session as well in regards to if you're deemed to be brain dead or your heart has failed. Um, and basically a number of issues were raised about did it cause the patient pain, even though they were... They were, their heart had stopped, but their brain hadn't stopped, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do you, what do you feel about that? About people, you know, basically, where they're not deemed to be dead, and they, it's deemed to do the PDS, PDPs procedure on these uh, patients. Um, obviously, it's going to be set out, might be set out in regulations. I just wondered what 
Did you have concerns in regards to that? Families certainly, you know, people certainly raise concerns in this area. Um, I mean, this is a, an, an area which I, again, um, I've got um, a better understanding, though not a perfect understanding. So, um, uh, I was at a, a one organ donation conference where one of the doctors said um, his, his whole talk was on, you know, when is somebody actually dead? Um, and and just talking about the difficulties of, or and, and different um uh, definitions of death um, and that was an eye-opener to me because I you know had just thought there was a one state or the other um, and and what you get into with these pre-death procedures is, is this um, uh, for for a lay person um, it's quite hard to understand that someone might be death under mm -hmm. uh, dead under some criteria but there um, are, are things that they ought to do or, or can do in order to make organ donation um, uh, uh, more, I would say better in these circumstances. Um, I, th I think the, the, the final point on, this, on the briefing note, some people s said there was distaste about the name of the pre-death procedures, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's definitely something that, that's an awkward phrase. It's, it, it just sounds quite nasty, um, but it's not just about um, calling something a different name. Um, you know, so, some of these things, um, I, I think it, you've got to be clear with the relatives about what's going to happen there um, so that people do no, do understand what's happening and why, and that might involve a discussion of, of this um, definition of, of what it what is death. Um, okay. Anybody else? Can, can I? So I just wanted to, to further follow that up. <clears throat> I mean, I'm a lay person as well, and I didn't realise this type of thing. And obviously, if something happens, you some organs won't survive if they're, if they're not transplanted. But apart from the fact that the name pre-death uh, procedures is you know something you wouldn't want to ask anybody, it's the deemed consent, deemed authorisation, which worried a lot of people. They thought if deemed authorisation was there, then the pre-death procedure could go ahead just to get the organs. Um, is there anything we can do in regards to the bill that would explain to people that this necessarily wouldn't happen? Language or you know, educate people, myself included, actually, <laughs> into these types of things? I think it needs to be made very clear to the public and to family members that pre-death procedures could take place because... It might be that they're not even aware of what that is at the moment. And I think if you have that initial organ donation conversation with people, they, the prop, first thing they would say, if you brought that up, please, what is that? And I think when you say, when you talk about organ donation, people think from the point that everything's switched off, you're no longer there. So I think that is probably the starting point for it, um, mm -hmm. because there's complete lack of understanding there of what it is. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. I'm itching to get in here because I want to <coughs> clarify what pre-death procedures are. Are we talking about extra IV lines or arterial lines or central venous access or changing medication that would improve renal function? Because some meds might improve renal function, but they compromise liver function. So is that what we're talking about when we're saying pre-death procedures? We're talking about how do we optimise organs in preparation because we know we're moving forward with a donation process, but... It's not just about, you know, doing things without consent. It's about preparing um, for donation in the most optimal way. Again, very good questions. Perhaps there'll be other witnesses who will have a more uh, medical uh, perspective on that, but certainly, Gillian, if you My, would my like. understanding is that it's exactly, as you've just said, that it is um, understanding that the, um, the, the person is going to become an organ donor and and on that basis um, there are some procedures which they will do to help um, um, make sure that the organs are working as efficiently as possible um, and they wouldn't do these procedures if the person was not going to become an organ donor so it's a clinical judgment essentially uh, Alec Colhampton, I think a very supplementary. Thank you, Igamido. Well, this is about um, the financial memorandum yep. and capacity. Yep. Okay. Indeed. Indeed. Um, I, I think, obviously, if this bill is to be a success, it will 
lead to a greater number of organ transplants happening in this country and otherwise why are we here? Um, but to that end, I, I just wonder if the panel can explore whether there's sufficient capacity within the bill, particularly in the financial memorandum, to recognise the uh, increase in uh, workforce that will require both in specialist nurses and surgical capacity. Um, will we be ready for this um, if we pass the bill as it currently stands? So I think um, one of the points that was raised in the space briefing was that um, the Scottish Government have recognised that they're already funding to the 2020 capacity, um, which is a target that they set, which they're not meeting at the minute. So there's 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 funding there for, for extra... Um, uh, that, that that extra uh, impact, uh, the the positive impact it will have. Um, I suppose that the the other part, and, and this came out in the, the members' bill previously, was that um, you know how how much what pounds and pence do we put on a person's life, and, and that, that's what we're you know we're talking about here as someone um, certainly from a heart aspect surviving or or not surviving. Um, now for you know the UK transplant list has trebled in the last ten years in terms of. Um, people waiting for a heart um, is 150% higher in four years in Scotland. So there is a need for more transplants. Um, it will come with a cost. Um, but that um, um, somebody later might have the exact figures for you, but I remember um, Kidney Research did an analysis of how much it was to keep someone on dialysis versus giving someone a transplant and the costs were significantly less to give them a transplant and, and, and bring them off dialysis so um, that may be something that comes up later on um, if not I can send the figures into the committee but uh, you know the, the Scottish Government have been clear that there's money there in the 2020 target um, and also that um, you know that that point about you know we're talking about people who are who are waiting on a second chance for life here. It, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not concerned that uh, we will need to spend more money on this. I absolutely get the preventative um, agenda, as you described there. My only question is, will, I just want to be sure that we're ready, both in terms of workforce and finance, to absorb the additional demand that this bill will create. I, I, think, um, I learned a lesson at one of our um, commissioning meetings um, when we were looking at... Um, uh, uh, the, the finances of transplantation and I certainly found out that as a lung transplant recipient I was funded by um, effectively by all the kidney transplants that I mean the, the kidney transplant program um, is so successful in terms of on the financial point of view um, versus the cost of dialysis that it um, all our, our lucky heart and lung transplantees we, we benefit from that so taking the finance aside I think the practical um, implications um, our local Lothian Organ Donation <coughs> Committee um, is having quite a big discussion at the moment on theatre capacity um, because at the moment most transplants are done um, in the evenings. Um, obviously, they're <coughs> unscheduled. They can't be scheduled in a way that other operations, elective surgery, can be. Um, so they usually happen at night for that reason. And, the, and um, I'm aware that locally there's a, a discussion about pressure on, on, uh, on theatres for um, doing... Uh, transplants um, so there's a number of resource issues that that would follow through probably best again speaking to the the, the witnesses in in that area um, but if if numbers increase um, past the 19 the 2020 levels then I think that's something that's got to be considered thank you very much and can I say thank you to all of our witnesses this morning uh, it's been very helpful to the committee uh, clearly there have been one or two questions asked which Perhaps there were no immediate answers to, or, or on which you may reflect and uh, feel that there's something else you would have liked to have said. So do feel free uh, to make a post-appearance submission if there's anything uh, that you would like to draw to our attention. Thank you very much. We'll now suspend the meeting for five minutes uh, to allow the panel to change.
resume. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, can I welcome to the committee uh, Shabin Begum, the Director of the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance, Fiona Loud, Policy Director with Kidney Care UK, and Dr Gordon MacDonald, Parliamentary Officer, Care for Scotland. Can I uh, thank you for coming to join us this morning? I know you, uh, or, or, or at least some of the witnesses, sat in on at least some of the previous uh, evidence sessions, so you will not then be surprised if I simply start with a general question. Uh, uh, do the witnesses believe there is a need for the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill, and do you believe that it will result in a marked difference in practice? Fiona? Okay, I'll start. So, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Kidney Care UK is a national kidney patient support charity, and we really do welcome the opportunity to increase the number of transplants in Scotland and, in fact, across the whole country as a consequence of that. With people dying every single day waiting for a transplant, many of them waiting for a kidney, we know that there's more that can be done. And so we absolutely believe that changing the rules so that uh, it is presumed that you will be a donor unless you've said otherwise in life is the right thing to do. But we believe that it is not the only thing to do. It will only work if we take account of the views of the public. And so we are very careful and very clear about the education and the promotion the, continu the continuous and consistent message across the country about what this is what it's aiming to do, what it means, and how what your rights are within this. We also believe that it must be supported by the right uh, capacity within the health service to do that. But we certainly believe that it has the opportunity to transform lives. And for many kidney patients, that feel very strongly about this. This is, gives them <coughs> some hope for a far better future, for a life that is transformed through a transplant. Thank you very much, Shabin. Um, we support this bill, but our main motivation for responding to the consultation was that we felt that the bill needs to be strengthened in considering the needs of people who might have limited capacity or limitations on their communication or other marginalised groups, and so that's what we're interested in, really. Thank you very much. Gordon MacDonald. Um, I think we would say no is the answer to the question. Um, what is needed is improvements in the administrative system um, around organ donation. Um, certainly the um, evidence from Spain suggests that it's not um, presumed consent, legis a legislative change introducing presumed consent that matters, but it's rather the administrative system, the improvements in the administrative system, particularly having specialist organ donation nurses. Um, and we would suggest that it would be better to invest the money in that. Um, certainly the Nuffield Council of Bioethics found that where specialist organ donation nurses exist, that the donation rates increase from 27.5 to 68.6 per cent, and that, I think, speaks for itself. We, we've, we've already met in the committee with so, several of the organ donation specialist nurses. Is your point really to say that there should be more rather than a change in the law? Is that essentially the point you're making? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, coming from uh, different perspectives uh, 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 in, in all three cases, I guess. Um, but one of the key questions which has ar uh, arisen is the, quest the question of the wishes of family members. And under the current legislation, there is no formal place for the wishes of family members. And within the bill, there is no formal place for the wish of family members. Would uh, witnesses believe that should change, that the wishes of family members should in some way be written uh, into the legislation. I think it's yep. very, very difficult for a clinician to go against the wishes of the family in a, a particularly difficult and sensitive time. Um, so um, whether the bill it's written into the bill or not, I think the practice will be, as it seems to be the case in Wales, um, that clinicians will not go against the wishes of the family. Um, and so um, I, I think there is a very dangerous precedent in, uh, in allowing clinicians to override the family, um, particularly where there's, no, um, where there's been no opt-in on the part of the deceased. Um, and uh, clinicians, I'm sure, are very conscious of that, although you would obviously have to speak to them in any case. Um, so I think that um, uh, the, the bill, um, I mean, we wouldn't wish to see presumed consent in, in, introduced in any case. Um, but we would certainly want families to have um, a strong say 
um, as to whether or not and to be involved in the process. And indeed, that seems to be the, the evidence from Spain and other places that the key thing here is dialogue and communication with families rather than passing bits of legislation. Shabim. I think that um, in order for... Well, the, the, I think the legislation needs to be really clear about rights. Um, and I think that if it doesn't mention anything about the rights of family, then that's a, that's a, a potential barrier to the success of the, of the legislation. I think that there needs to be that consideration. Um, the, the bill needs to have safeguards in place for potential donors, for family members, and also for clinicians. Um, the, the previous panel gave evidence around um, the, the lack of clarity for the clinicians and how it would be difficult for a clinician to go against the wishes of a family member. And I agree that I don't think we should be putting individual clinicians or teams in that position of having to, to be in dispute with, with family members. But also, equally, if I was... Um, you know, I, I carry a donor card, and so I think that if something happened to me, I it, my family would be in that situation of parts of my family being... Um, wanting to support my wishes and then other parts of my family not wanting to support my wishes and so I think that good robust legislation would need to take that kind of nuance into consideration um, to safeguard everyone and to protect my rights to make that kind of decision. So we think that a soft opt-out is the right thing to do. So it does allow the family to present evidence as to why their loved one would not have wished to become a donor. But we also think, and we've heard it said earlier today as well, that really encouraging the conversation with family members all the time. So if anyone takes the option you know, to opt in, great. We would, we would say to people, please do let your family members know what your wishes are. But even if you don't take that option, you're content to have your consent deemed, still we'd like to see people be encouraged to have that conversation. Because by having that conversation, by knowing what your loved one's wishes are, will make it, will continue to make it much easier. And I think we should look at what's happened in Wales um, and the right to a soft opt-out remaining there, what is proposed in England as well, so that we can have some consistency as well. And that, of course, the importance of training staff so they can understand that. And if I go back to Wales, looking at uh, what they learned about how they started to present what the what the new rules were and how they sort of matured over time, I suppose, and being able to become more confident of saying, well, this is the rules, this is this is the laws, but we'd like to work with you as a family around the donation. And I've actually heard family members from Wales speak about that and and also very approvingly of the way in which it was introduced to them when this was a deemed uh, authorisation. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Thank you, Gavina. Good morning to, to the panel. What assessment uh, have you made um, of the strengths of the, the gift concept in the current legislation? So, Fiona. From, from kidney, from the, the point of view of, if I speak from the recipients first of all, so the kidney patients, um, there are, I think there's about uh, 464 of them waiting for or hoping for a transplant in this country at the moment. Any kidney patient who ever receives a transplant has the most, the absolute, the greatest respect for their donors, and they never, ever forget them. They remember them, they speak of them with huge respect all the time. So I think from the point of view of recipients, most of the, they will see that as a gift, and they will be forever grateful for the life transformation that that donor and their family have been able to, to grant to them. From the point of view of, of donor families, you know, we have spoken with many donor families and they, they, they will see that as their gift, as that donation as well. And the ones that we've spoken with are very proud to say that. And the ones that we've spoken with, and I appreciate this is only you know, a selection, so I'm just telling it as a story rather than a, as factual evidence, will also say that provided that they, their wishes are still considered in the way we've just dis, 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 described in terms of a soft opt-out um, and that their donations continue to be to be um, respected and spoken of in the highest possible terms uh, and accepted as you know vital part of, of 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 what we're doing here that they are they are supportive of it and that they still they still see that as a gift they don't see it taken away and I appreciate not everybody feels that way but those are the evidence that, that we've heard from the folk we work with. I think one of the strengths of the bill is that we've got this concept of it being a gift. Mm. I think that it would be dangerous to squander that and and 
introduce any element of compulsion or that the state had certain rights over the body of, a, of an individual um, and, and kind of marginalised or sidelined the wishes of the family. So I think um, this, uh, this, this bill being packaged um, as, as, as me being able to provide a gift to other people within society is a really, really powerful mm. message. And I think that the public would be open and amenable to that kind of message rather than the, 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 you know, something happens to me and the state can do whatever it likes um, with my body. Gordon? I think the gift element is very important, and certainly the organ donor task force, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, uh, found that when they um, did their study in 2008, that the gift element was important, not just to, to donors, but also to the recipients. Um, and I think there is a danger of moving away from the gift element, um, precisely the point that's just been made, that if the perception is that, that this is no longer a gift, that the state is claiming a right, um, then the danger is that people choose to opt out of the system, which is what seems to have happened in Wales, that the, the number of people opting out has gone up to 182,000, I think, or maybe 187,000, I can't remember the exact figure, which is about 6% of the population. Whereas if you look in the other constituent parts of the UK, it's less than 1% of the population that have opted out. Now, the effect of that is um, that rather than 99% of the population being potential donors, because, of course, the fact that I, well, I have opted into the donor register, but if I hadn't opted into the donor register and something happened to me, my wife could still donate my organs. Um, so rather than 99% being potential donors, you have 90 uh, four percent in Wales being potential donors. So I think you know we we do have to think about the the potential negative consequences of moving away from the gift element mm. towards a, um, a even if it's not in practice, it, at least the perception and the formal informality in law, uh, a compulsion approach. Mm. Related to then my first question, which you've just answered, how important is simplicity of language in the bill? Well, the bill and any associated um, documentation should be clear, I think, and should be honest. Um, part of the problem in Wales was that there was a, a fundamental um, misconception at the core of the debate, which was that the Spanish system um, was essentially a presumed consent system, whereas in practice it's an informed consent system because there's no opt-out register in, in Spain, um, and certainly a a study in the BMJ um, uh, by Professor Faber and others, including the, the leading Spanish clinician in this area, argued that that was the case, that it wasn't, in fact, in practice, um, a deemed authorisation or presumed consent system. It was, in fact, the system that we have in practice. And I think that certainly the last time the Health Committee considered this issue, and I gave evidence on that occasion as well, um, some members of the Health Committee went over to Spain and spoke to the Spanish um, mm. authorities, and I would certainly recommend that you do the same again. Mm. Yes, Fiona, please. Thank you. Um, indeed, there's been a, a great deal of debate about why Spain has been so successful in uh, achieving you know, world, world leader in, in organ donation and transplantation. And um, I think it's important to say that what Spain has done is, is all the things that we'd like to see happen. So it has really built its base in terms of capacity, in terms of training its staff, as well as having a default that, that you're considered to be a donor unless, you know, and obviously <coughs> there's, a different, there's a conversation that goes along in Spain with, with poten every potential donor and, and their family. And actually, when the Organ Donation Task Force reported back in 2008, it recommended a number of things based on the Spanish experience. So it recommended the implementation of organ donation committees, of, of trained staff, clinical leads and so forth, and embedding specialist nurses in, in hospitals and a whole range of public education things. But it didn't recommend, as we know, to go with, with the presumed consent approach. This is 10 years on. Many of those things have been put into place. There's still more to do on, on, some, of those, on some of those things. But the one thing it hasn't, we haven't yet done is the thing that Spain has done and other successful countries, such as Croatia and so forth, um, which is to change the law as well, to go along with it. So it's that combination of all those mm. things that we think is the right thing to do and that we hope, believe, that the Scottish Government is planning to do. Can I, can I just make a point about Croatia, actually, if you don't mind, because sure. Croatia is quite an, um, an interesting case study because it now sits up at the same rates that Spain is sitting at. 
Um, but what happened in Croatia was, of course, they introduced presumed consent first uh, in legislation, and it didn't make any difference to the rates. And it was only after they did the, all the other things um, that the rates started to increase, which suggests that there isn't a direct link between introducing the legislation and the system and increasing the, the rates. It's actually the other things that, that make the difference. Unless, I suppose, the change in the legislation changed the context. Which was Sorry? Unless, unless the view was taken that the change in legislation changed the context and made these other changes easier to deliver. Um, yes, but it was some years later, I think. And I think, I mean, we, we can send you further evidence on that. But, yeah. Okay, no, that's appreciated. Just, just, just to, to add to that, by changing the context and by changing the national conversation alongside all those things, that that's the thing that, that will make the difference. And that's why I was quoting that particular country. So it's... It's all of those things together. So you're changing the default, but you're changing the support system alongside it. Oh, yep. yeah. With it. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Just a wee uh, quick um, sup. I mean, uh, in our additional evidence, um, or when we first started this, about over 80% of Scots said they would donate their organs. So I've had conversations with people that think that the deemed authorisation is a, a way to allow folk that just haven't got round to putting their names on the organ donor register. So what would be your comments around, or your response to that? I think the point I made earlier, which is that actually, um, nine, you know, we're talking about nine plus, over 99% potential donors in Scotland who haven't opted out. And so whilst I take your point that we're sitting at 50%, which is actually very good compared to the rest of the UK, um, in terms of people who've opted in, there is that sort of 49% or so and, you know, the figure you're quoting there is 80%. You know, there is a, a good 30% of people there who are realistically potential donors. The key thing in, the, in relation to that is going to be the conversations that are had with the family around the, the, the time of the death. And that's where we would come back to our point that, you know, the best thing to do and to use the resource well is to invest in organ donation nurses. And certainly the, the UK government's figures are 45 million start-up costs and then 2 million a year to run the, the system and then another 5 million or so every five years to, to run a publicity campaign. Well, I don't know what the figures are for Scotland, but that money could certainly be better spent, in our view, in investing in staff and in family <coughs> communication. So could I just, just comment on the 8 out of 10 being in support of organ donation, but only about, well, as we know, about half the population which, for which Scotland is to be absolutely congratulated are actually on the organ donor register. So we've still, what we have is a group of people who, up to 80%, who say that they would support and would be willing to donate, who, ha who would be captured perhaps isn't the right word, but who would be covered by the, by the, by the deemed um, authorisation bill, and that would be where we would think would be the absolute would be the gains because there'll always be people, of course, who will choose not to donate, who will not wish to donate, and having that right to to opt out, of course, is, is incredibly important as part of the democratic um, uh, work with this bill. Well, the bill um, itself increased donation rates, and if no, yes or no, that's good. But if not, um, would there be what would the areas that would need to be? I guess, invested in, you've mentioned some already, to increase donation or people on the organ donor register. So can I just say that I, I think that the way that we need to, to, so your point earlier on was a really good illustration of the lack of awareness and lack of understanding around this complicated area. And, and also, I think it, because it's so emotive and people think that, you know, if, I, if I'm carrying a, a donor card, that that's, going to, that that's the end of the story and my wishes will be, uh, will be safeguarded. I think that we need to have a, a bigger conversation within society. We don't talk about mortality. Lots of us don't have wills. We don't. Um, lots of people don't have advanced statements, which is something that the Mental Health Act allows for. So I, I think that there's all sorts of things that need to happen in terms of infrastructure and, and finances, but also we need to have a conversation within society on a bigger level about what happens when we die and what we would like to see happen. I think the key issue is going to be, uh, you know, to look, is to look at what has happened in Wales over the last four years or so. And the, the evidence from Wales, and everybody acknowledges this, including the Welsh Government, um, 
um, is inconclusive at the moment. Um, however, um, certainly from looking at the stats which I included in our submission, um, there's no clear um, link, I think, in terms of improving the figures. Uh, and in fact, what really struck me when I, when I, when I looked at the uh, NHS BT figures was that the deceased donor rate Incre is increasing in all the other three jurisdictions in the UK, but but in Wales it was it was um, not on a on a um, regular trajectory of increasing, shall we say? Um, it goes up and down each year, and that's why it's quite difficult to to just take a few years and, and make an assessment. And I do think that um, there needs to be more time given to see what happens in Wales before the Scottish government and Scottish Parliament should legislate in this area. So this is a national conversation, and it's a it's it's a it's almost a once in a lifetime opportunity for us across the whole country to to be able to raise our game and raise the conversation and have that that open national conversation that that should be just just spoke so so clearly about and and what we're seeing, I believe, is the raising in numbers of, of deceased donations is probably because we're having this this national conversation in in most of our countries now about what what's going to happen next uh, and where, where it will go. But we do have to be careful, as one of the earlier witnesses said, because many people think the bill's already gone through. Oh, we've heard about that on the news. It's already happened. And actually, it's still going, it's still going through all of this. And as a simple response back to original comment there about do we think the numbers will go up over time? Yes, we do think the numbers will go up over time. And I think what we should be looking at is the consent rate. In Wales, it's now something like 72 73%, which is which is a, a huge, I think it was about 40 something percent when this started. So it's an enormous increase in consent. And if looking at family consent rates to donate is probably the best thing to look at because, of course, as we just heard, numbers will vary from year to year when you have perhaps a relatively small number of donors where one or two additional do donors can make all the difference to the numbers of actual transplants. And I think that's incredibly encouraging. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle. You've been uh, in one of the panel, and uh, actually, if you want to, uh, you've answered some of the questions I was going to ask there. But, uh, 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 but it was uh, it was around that uh, uh, issue that we've heard in evidence many times that uh, uh, family consent is probably one of the major issues that have to be tackled within uh, organ donation. And uh, I suppose it's specifically to, to Dr. McDonald. And, and I wonder if you you know acknowledge that uh, Wales' success in raising that uh, family consent rate, and whether that is probably more of a, a more important an indicator uh, of success rather than the number of people who have opted out. I think it, I think we don't know what the reasons are. That's that's the key thing. I mean, is it to do with um, passing legislation on presumed consent, or is it to do with, as has been commented on, all the the discussion around it that has been taking place in terms of the media and including the information campaigns which have been funded. Um, or is it to do with investment in in specialist staff and improving communication with families? So that's the issue that's not clear. I mean, I, I think, and I think that that's where there needs to be some sort of bottoming out, really, as to what has caused that, rather than just assuming that it's to do with passing the legislation. You can certainly have a national conversation um, without passing this legislation. You can certainly invest in pub publicity campaigns without passing this legislation. And we would certainly support both of those things. Okay. Would, you, would you then uh, uh, agree with me then that the, the very fact that we're having this discussion around this legislation in and its, in and itself is having an impact in, in the country? Um, it, it may be having an impact. Um, the, the, the danger is that it has a negative impact, as has been seen in Wales, in relation to um, a significant percentage of the population who say, well, I wouldn't have minded in the past or donating my organs, but if the government's going to claim it, then you can get lost. And so I think, you know, that's the real danger. OK, can I just jump in very, very briefly? I think your focus is very much on the opt-out here. Mm. Surely the outcome should be the number of donations, organ donations that actually, uh, actually come to the fore, rather than who's opting out. Well, indeed, but that's the point that the, the number of deceased donor donations, the de deceased organ donations, has increased in other parts of the UK, but doesn't seem to be increasing in a steady trajectory in Wales. And uh, that's, you know, that the reason for that needs to be got to the bottom of, because the Welsh Government made, made all sorts of claims 
based on an academic study that there would be an increase of 25 to 30 percent um, and the the evidence to date and as I say you have to give it a bit longer to see how things develop but the evidence to date suggests that that isn't happening um, on a regular basis and that being the case uh, then the the danger is that you have an adverse impact rather than a put there than the positive impact that you were hoping to have whereas if you did other things um, you can have that positive impact. And I think that's, to be fair to the Scottish Government, that's what the Scottish Government has been doing. The Scottish Government has been putting a lot of effort into improving communication and putting extra resources into organ donation, which is why we have seen the, the rates going up in Scotland uh, on a steady basis and also the number of donors going up in Scotland and people who are opting in going up in Scotland. So I would go back to... the. The, the, what we can learn from, from Wales, uh, and I have no doubt this committee will, will be taking evidence from, from folk in, in Wales as well, to say that if we turn it around the other way, it's that startling increase in family con in consent, which I think is, 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 is very, very strong in terms of the impact of, of the work they've done there, but also to learn from what they learnt, which was around the uh, importance of training staff, which I guess they knew about, but actually seeing that in action, and also on keeping family families and family members continually targeted on what the new what the new rules are and what the, what the law means and actually as so we turn it around that way we now have a situation in Wales where there are far more members of the public who who will know about organ donation and families who as a consequence um, have agreed to donate whichever through whichever route they've gone and we would we would far rather have you know that 80 percent of the population be willing to donate with, with of course the the option for those who don't wish to donate for whatever reasons they are. And I'm not sure we know enough about why people will have taken the, the option to opt out already, but that might be something to look at in the future. But actually, you know, that's, that is their right, and there's, there's no way that any of this is about a compulsion, but it's about changing the default so that, as a nation, Scotland is a country that, that accepts that the organ donation is, is the natural thing to do with all the safeguards that I know we're discussing. OK, thank you very much. Keith Brown. By the evidence so far, I think Fiona mentioned, I think the one phrase you used was that the person would have been content to have given their deemed consent, um, for which, of course, the bill makes no provision. But um, And I think she has been mentioned a scenario, quite rightly, where family members might have different views. And I think Gordon mentioned the fact that um, clinicians will have an obligation to listen to uh, the families. Although... I would have thought clinicians would have an obligation to the person that may be a patient as well. It may not be a patient, it could be deceased. I don't know what the legal standing is of that person. It just strikes me that in that scenario, the individual whose body is comes potentially third or fourth after the state, after the families, potentially after the interests of the clinicians. And surely there must be some recognition, which we've heard very little of so far, of the rights of the individual, especially if the individual's expressed a wish either to... Um, donate or not to donate where i'd just be interested rather asking a direct question interested in the views of the panel on the rights of the individual whose body it is i think that it's the the individual's rights that are paramount in this situation and and, and i think that the the issue i touched on earlier on about we can't have a situation where there's even a perception of compulsion in 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 this legislation I think that it's interesting that um, you talk about, you, you mentioned the state as having rights, first of all, and I think that this, this could be a potentially tricky situation of balancing the rights of different groups. And, and that's always tricky, um, and that you know the, the rights of the individual need to be paramount. I think that we can't have a situation where clinicians know that there are other patients waiting for for organs, for a kidney or whatever. That that is the, their motivation for for carrying out a procedure. It should be the wishes of the individual uh, that are of the highest consideration. Is at uh, the heart of this debate actually um, the the individual who is the donor um, their view should be respected if it has been expressed there's no question about that I think and clearly in some situations families have um, have overruled that and that is a, is a difficult scenario for for clinical staff 
and <coughs> there, there needs to be more work done with families in order to reduce that from happening, I think. Um, the, the problem is, because that's about respecting people, respecting the autonomy of people who have in, you know, in, in, who are mentally competent, who've made a, made a decision. Um, the, the issue here is about the people who haven't expressed a view one way or the other. And the, whilst probably the majority of those people would be content to donate, there will be some of them who would not be content to donate. Um, and so in those situations, um, the state is then claiming a right um, uh, which overrules um, that individual's right. Now, at the, in, under the present system, essentially the family make the decision. The family say, well, they haven't made a decision, but we think it would have been. Now, it might be that they're reflecting the deceased view, or it might be re they're reflecting their own view, but that's the best we can do, in a sense, in terms of trying to get to what the deceased, um, or, or trying to get consent. The, it, it's important philosophically that we understand that the state doesn't have rights over us. It has responsibilities to respect our rights. That's the way human rights work. It's the state, the state, the duty is on the state to respect our rights and the rights are not given to us by the state. The rights are inherent. We have inherent human rights. Um, and they are recognised. Human rights legislation is about recognising the fact that we have inherent human rights. So when we get into a discussion, uh, and I'm sure this wasn't what you intended, but when we get into a discussion which is sort of implying that the state somehow or other has rights over our over our bodies or over uh, um, other parts of our person, then I think that's quite a dangerous philosophical step to make um, as a society. And I think that we need to just be very careful um, not to be so focused on the pragmatism of trying to get numbers of donations up and doing anything to do that, it, that we end up crossing over a, a, a red line in relation to the relationship between the state and, and, the, and the individual. Thank you. So, um, I think it's absolutely right that you know, the individual right, if an individual has expressed a view to, <coughs> to opt in and opt out, of course that, that, that should be honoured and Many patients we've worked with have said, you know, I want to donate and I don't want anyone to be able to, to override that. Now, in practice, we know that occasionally somebody who has currently opted in, their, their rules, their views are currently overridden because, because the family has to make the, the, uh, the final decision nowadays. And so if the, the rules are to change, then we do have to have a very careful and nuanced conversation about, about where that goes and what that actually means. So to provide the opportunity for the fa patient's family to be able to say, well, that person has changed their mind and we know that person has changed their mind because people, you know, people may change their mind. You know, we, we, we heard earlier um, from Gillian who, who said she'd, she'd changed her mind about how, how these things will work and, and others may do that. So as long as we provide that, that opportunity and that safeguard in there, but we, but we, but we honour the right of the individual when they've expressed a right to do that, 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 that's very important. Now, for those people who haven't expressed a view, but where no other view is, is, is known, that's what the communication, the discussion, and all those other things should, should be addressing, and that's why it's very important that we are as clear as we possibly can with what the new rules are, should they change. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Convener. I wanted to um, come back to really the rights of families in a soft opt out, because I think that's really where the committee have been um, Really focusing some attention. I wondered, probably more, I think, for uh, Dr. MacDonald, you obviously were involved in the past bill um, when that came forward. I think this is the third bill, actually, uh, the Parliament's seen around this. Um, where do you think the current bill uh, has addressed some of those concerns, and are there some positive steps forward you've seen? I mean, I'll need to try and rack my brains as to what the details were in the past bill, but I think there were concerns the last time round about um, this, the practical procedures, I think, as I recall, um, in, which was one of the main reasons why the committee rejected it. But I was interested reading the, the spice briefing that the, the committee, the majority of the committee, also rejected it because they weren't convinced it was going to make any difference, actually, in terms of the numbers, which which I found quite interesting. Um, but certainly, the, the 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 evidence I gave was part of a, one of these private sort of co informal consultations where we have two MSPs and a whole bunch of people sitting around the table. And it was very noticeable that everybody from a variety of faith perspectives um, had reservations 
Um, and I don't know whether that impacted the committee or not, but because it was only two MSPs that were there, but um, but it was it was very noticeable that this was something that people had real reservations about, and and there was more un <laughs> somewhat ironically, and there was more unanimity than there is on many issues actually between different people from different faith traditions on the on this point. I mean, uh, my comment would be that I understood it was to do with the practicalities and perhaps being a little bit over over complex, and that therefore, and I would suggest that this bill is. Is, is more straightforward and perhaps there's more things we can discuss about keeping it as, and making it as straightforward as possible. I know some of the previous witnesses discussed that. Shabim, did you have anything um, to add? Well, no. my point would be that legislation quite often isn't that accessible and so maybe that's, some, that's a challenge for this, this time round then to make it as accessible as possible but also to engage the public in the consultation. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle. A, a, a very sort of brief uh, uh, supplementary to some of the, the, the comments we were making earlier on. I think the idea that uh, you know if this legislation goes through, all of a sudden that will make this huge impact on uh, on the numbers who donate is maybe where uh, I, I, I wanted to put the question. I mean, would you accept that, that there's a period of time that will be required for this for, for this to sort of you know cascade down, if you like? You know, it takes in. Perhaps an increase in, in family consent that somewhere down the line uh, it, it may lead to an increase in donation. I wonder, you know, there are um, uh, uh, other examples around uh, around the world that have have over a period of time uh, uh, shown that increase. And I wonder, if, if, is there a, a period of time we should expect, uh, or, or should be a, a, at least willing to to work towards that uh, that would that would help that conversation. So, so if, if if we absolutely, I this is not something that's we aren't, it's not a magic wand that we can just wave and suddenly everything's marvelous because if it was we would have probably done it an awful long time ago so if we look at wales that was in december 2015 so that's that's three years ago we're still that's still learning there's, there's still work going on in there and i believe the welsh government's looking probably up to 10 years i think before it does a final evaluation on that um, if we look at other countries we've quoted spain and croatia and so forth we quoted again periods of a number of years before the really big changes have started to, to come into play and I notice also at the financial briefing for this bill there's something about not expecting to have to increase capacity um, for transplantation until something like year four I believe that's right so I could correct me if I'm wrong but something like that so in other words you're already looking at uh, realizing that's going to there's going to be a period of time before we get the up take so probably it's going to be five to ten years I should think because it's a you know it's a it's a whole lifetime change isn't it and also for that message which will come through and perhaps be taken up by many of the younger generation who we know tend to sign up and opt in uh, quite willingly and of course in the education system as well for that to come for those people to mature through the system you know, in their own in their own lives as well mm. so that would be my suggestion based on that evidence okay anyone else uh, Alec Colhampton. Sorry, Colhampton. I think I think the figures from Wales are interesting because 2014-15 um, was 128 deceased donor transplants. 2015-16, as we heard, it came in then it, went, it was 168, but in 2016-17 it was 135, and in 2017-18 it's 139. So, you know, we don't have a lot of a lot, a long period of da data there in Wales, but certainly the uh, the um, uh, the limited data that we do have doesn't suggest that the new bill has made this a spectacular difference. In fact, um, potentially it might have uh, it might have reduced the numbers compared to the 2015-16 period. But that's speculation, as I said, it's because ultimately, what the biggest impact on the numbers is the number of people who are dying in, in the appropriate circumstances. And this is where, again, I think there's perhaps sometimes a misconception that that there will be a huge increase in the numbers of organs available because there's only 1% of deaths that are in the appropriate circumstances where a donation can take place. Um, so that that is the that's the, the key factor, I think, in terms of the, the rates. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning to the panel. Um, I was very struck, I know, Gordon McDonald, that you're not in favour of this bill, but I was struck by what we could do in your estimation to improve organ donations, and, and that was about uh, dealing with administration. And I think my question is particularly to yourself and Shabin in terms of um, what we do when we're consulting families at the moment and what we might do in the context of this bill. Because we met with specialist nurses who took us through the process, which revealed that there are something like 300 questions that are asked to grieving families at their most vulnerable time, which actually leads to many families overriding and just saying, listen, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Um, I think first, as you've been, um, obviously advocacy is really important, getting people's views are important, but can we use this bill to simplify that process, to make it easier so that people can express their views without having to go into intimate minutiae of detail around their partner or their son or daughter's lifestyle and their suitability for transplant? I was a little bit taken aback by the, the, the fact that there's 300 questions. So um, I think that that's going to be a barrier. If somebody, if family members are in an emo emotional situation and aren't able to, to really think that clearly, and then especially when there's a dispute, I think that if uh, the, the scenario that I gave of my family would be in that situation, um, and I I think that it's it, so I would I would completely support the reduction of those questions and the significance of those questions and the the intrusive nature. Um, earlier on, the panel were talking about some of the intrusive nature of, of of those questions. I think that advocacy would work really really well in those situations where people could could plan ahead and help people to think about what it meant to opt into a situation. But also it would give, I think, the individual, it would give them the, the strength and courage to have those conversations with their own family members. And advocacy might help specifically for those people who've got capacity issues or communication difficulties. But I think non-instructed advocacy would work well in those situations where somebody is, we talked earlier on, about the pre-death situation that, so, you know, I'm not able to, to speak up for myself, but an, a non-instructed advocate might be able to, to, to safeguard my wishes in that situation. So I think the, the, the point earlier on was about, will this bill make a, a difference straight away? I think that this bill is an example of a cultural shift that we need to have. And it isn't going to, it's not a panacea. It's not going to sort everything out immediately but it, it's it's about changing our culture around these kind of issues um so i would say that the um advocacy would play a, a key role in different situations for different people okay. Gordon. i think the the is, is if the problem is the administrative system then passing legislation is is unlikely to make a difference the key thing that will make a difference is rev reviewing the administrative system uh, and certainly I was um, surprised to hear the figure of 300 um, just at the end of the last discussion there, and I thought that that was quite astonishing, quite honestly, that that's the case. Um, my comment would be that if, if we're talking about 300 questions at the moment where people have opted in, um, then to put people in a situation where of presumed consent... Um, and then put them through, put relatives through such an onerous process um, is likely to cause um, great angst, I would have thought, um, if the relatives themselves are not convinced that this was the person's wishes. So I think that needs to be thought about that, um, uh, well, I think clearly they should, they should review the system and see if we can reduce the number of questions. You need to talk to clinicians about that, I think, and see how that could be done. But but I think I would caution um, if the system is so burdensome of creating a situation where relatives are at a very difficult time put in the position of having to answer 300 questions when they're not convinced in the first place that the, the, the deceased or the dying person would have wanted it. Fiona, before I ask Fiona, just, just for a little bit of clarification, there are up to 350 questions in actual fact 
um, that might be asked, but that assumes that the, some of those are down particular lines of questioning uh, in response to an earlier answer. Yeah. So by no means everyone is answering 300 questions, but it's potentially uh, that large. For clarification, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so a, a couple of things. Um, at the moment, um, the specialist nurses will be asking a whole range of questions right now, some of which will be, as you've heard from... So those questions will be necessary. I can't comment on the, the questions themselves because they'll be to do with safeguarding and, and that, that, that side of things. Um, I believe that in England the plan is for those... Rather than writing the questions or the, the need to ask those questions in law, that's covered by the codes of practice instead, so therefore it, it, it can be taken, consulted on separately through the Human Tissue Authority, and I would perhaps suggest that in order to keep the bill as simple as possible, that, that that side of things could go into the code of practice where it would still be absolutely and correctly dealt with, but maybe not come up as a potential barrier if, to, to, the, to this law coming through. So that might be one suggestion, alongside the fact that so already there are a range of questions which will be asked very sensitively by obviously very well-trained specialist nurses. We have heard from families who, who do find those questions distressing, but but the families that we've heard from have also said that they appreciate why those questions are being asked um, because, because they are in favour of donation and they want it to go through. And so keeping it simple and maybe removing it from the law but having it in the codes of practice as a different way of doing it would be our suggestion. Thank you very much. Yeah. If there are good clinical safety reasons why questions need to be asked, then those questions will presumably still need to be asked, even under presumed consent. Um, and so that's the key point I'm trying to make here. Fair, 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 fair point. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you. Um, in Wales, deemed consent um, is for 18 and above for people and individuals. Um, in Scotland, uh, deemed authorisation uh, will be 16 uh, and above. Do you agree that deemed authorisation should be 16? Agree in principle anyway, but the point that you were making is a valid point that needs to be looked into because otherwise there is a danger that the, the, there could be some sort of judicial review of the legislation if if it was different in Wales or in Scot or, or a judicial review of um, of the of a particular in in case um, if if legislation was different both sides of the border. So. So just to make a point on that, I think the messaging would have to be very very careful because it is different here than, than other countries and I also think that, that it should be looked into probably a, a little more just to understand whether there would be any implications of that and whether it would be better to be harmonious with the rest of the country or content to, to stay as is the, 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 the age here in Scotland. Um, we, we support 16 but I'd just like to point out that actually there's lots of anomalies between different pieces of legislation which consider a child at different different ages so 16 is usually the age of consent but then um, young people are considered to be adults at different pe different ages and different pieces of legislation so <laughs> this would be a continuation of some of those anomalies okay. thank you for that um, as you're saying now 16 and under is sometimes a, a different a difficult age group to engage with and especially to get them to engage with their parents how can we provide sufficient opportunity for uh, the young people to express their wishes Prior to the age of 16, I think that's it. Yeah. I'm going to say education, education, education. So as part of the school's curriculum, I know there are some, some excellent tools already out there which are aimed at, at secondary, secondary schools and at people 15 and 16 as well, so not just the, the, the slightly older young people, if that makes sense. So I think education, encouraging, but very much encouraging people to have those conversations with their families, because children, they often say, are the change makers, but by giving children that level of education in school, not in terms of you must do this or you mustn't do this, but as part of your, your own health education and, and being a part of society, so they can receive unbiased information about what that might mean and be encouraged to take that back and talk, talk it through with their their families as well, and that would be our point there. Thank you very much. 
I suppose some of the, the dealings that I have personally and professionally with young people are that some of them are much more enlightened and much more open-minded than lots of older people or adults anyway. So I'm, I'm not, I think I completely support Fiona's point about education and awareness raising, but actually I think that, the, that there, would be, there would be examples of young people changing the minds of their family members and parents as well, so... I think that's right. That's why I made the comment about yes, children's uh -huh. change makers. Change, yeah. mm -hmm. sure. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Gordon? Yes, I, mean, uh, I signed up to the organ donor register when I was renewing my car insurance uh, uh, tax, basically, and it came up with a thing saying, do you want? And I thought, well, OK, sort of thing. And so it would seem to me that, you know, when people are sitting a driving test, for example, or applying for a driving licence, you know, there, there are opportunities or even, even possibly... Um, maybe not the young Scott card because it's it's a younger age, but you know there will there will be opportunities in the system to engage young people, and these opportunities should be taken particularly, um, even even to express a view without necessarily making a commitment if they're if they're younger than sixteen possibly. Okay, fair enough. Okay. So one other comment would be about social media because that's incredibly, obviously incredibly important to young people and most of them will be world experts before, before they ever get anywhere near 16, but, but using that as an approach, of course, is important. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, well, good afternoon, nearly now. Uh, basically, uh, you did mention, and uh, it you mentioned about advocacy. The question I asked the previous panel, I'll, I'll ask yourself as well, about the pre-death procedures, which is, you know, the name of it is bad enough anyway. Um, we had concerns raised with us, uh, with the uh, other uh, witnesses as well, uh, and basically they're looking at um, procedures to go ahead and legislation would be put forward for that. Um, for, for donation to be deemed, but the details are not actually there uh, in regarding the pre-death procedures, and others, people actually raise concerns in regard to the deemed uh, authorisation that this would go ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the, the, the pre-death procedures? You did speak about, uh, you know, basically advocacy should be and perhaps that should be included before someone gets to that stage uh, yeah. I just wonder what your thoughts are on the pre-death procedures well I suppose uh, for advocacy to be effective and the the constituency that that we're interested in in this context would be those people who have limited capacity or um, limitations on communication but also those people who are covered by the Mental Health Act, because mm. I wouldn't want to see this legislation um, kind of discriminating against mm. a group of people and saying, well, you know, you, you can't donate your organs. Um, the, so capacity isn't a black and white issue. So people can make decisions about certain aspects of their life, um, but are deemed not to have enough capacity to, to so I, I might not be able to make decisions about my finances but I might be able to make decisions about mm -hmm. other aspects of my life and I think that so we've got we've got safeguards such as guardianship and power of attorney and those are the the places where I think that there needs to be consideration about organ donation and this would be obviously part of a, a national conversation mm -hmm. around donation. Um, I think that so in that particular situation of pre-death, so uh, the, the earlier panel were talking about this, you know, this isn't something that's scheduled, you can't plan for it in, in the way that other situations might be planned. And, and I think that if, if so in those situations, the, the non-instructed advocacy might play a really, really crucial role mm -hmm. to to make sure that the the rights and wishes of the person, because that's the, the issue that we raised earlier on about the uh, balancing the mm -hmm. rights of the family, the state, and the individual. And I think that advocacy plays a really, really crucial role in kind of a re uh, readdressing the inherent inherent imbalances of power and dynamics within relationships and this would be a prime example of that so there needs to be somebody who is there who's independent who doesn't have any kind of agenda within the situation but is only there to to safeguard my wishes and reinforce my rights and make sure that 
my rights and wishes are being listened to appropriately and the you know other people within that dynamic and within that situation will have their own agendas and their own wishes but especially when that person doesn't have a, a physical voice themselves i think it's really really important that there's some sort of mechanism for making sure that that isn't lost Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think the one one can understand why pre-death procedures would take place um, in order, as we heard earlier, to um, maximise the likelihood of success of a donation. Um, where I think there, there might be a concern might be if um, if there was any impact upon the care of a person who um, would otherwise um, not be dying, for example. And I think we sort of cited the. UK Supreme Court's recent judgment in relation to people with severe neurological conditions, etc. Um, so I, I think that um, you know there, there could be concerns around that. Um, you also raised in the earlier session the issue of um, people whose heart has stopped beating and, and their brain might still be functioning. And I, certainly I, I have heard people express concerns about organ donation on that basis in the past. Um, and so I do think that um, these issues need to be c carefully considered. Mm. I, just add that I think the concept of an advocate could be helpful in, in, in some situations, as Shabeen said. I think that in terms of being clear and transparent, that is important, and we, we should look to do that whilst being very sensitive to the fact that not everybody wants to know, not all families want to know all the details by, by any means. They, they want to know what's going to happen, how long it's going to take, but they don't necessarily want to know everything. And, but they have the right to, through with, with the support of a well-trained member of staff, to support them as, as they go through the donation process. Okay. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. And, uh, briefly, Emma Harper. Yeah, just a wee sub. Um, Sandra brought up uh, the question about pre-death procedures, but you mentioned incapacity. And so the... Base, basic question is, does the bill adequately cover people who might have communication difficulties or incapacity difficulties? And should there be more widening of any language in the bill to cover that? Our, our feeling was that it doesn't really adequately cover those, those groups of people um, and it needs to be strengthened. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. And Alicola Hamilton. Yes, um, um, just finishing off with a, a question about capacity in the financial memorandum. Now, I'm conscious that, that none of you are clinicians, but um, you may have a view, and that's whether, uh, from your experience working in the transplant world, and particularly Fiona in this, um, is there going to be sufficient capacity built in uh, after the bill to meet any increased demand? And are we making enough money available to that end in, ter in terms of workforce planning? I... I welcome the fact that in the financial memorandum there is a there is an estimate made of that which talks about I, be, I believe it is year four when numbers of of uh, staff need to go up to support the anticipated <coughs> increase in transplantation. So I think that is that is the right thing to do. But I think we need to watch very carefully and evaluate as we go along how this is working. Um, because what we don't want to have is, is families who's, who wish to donate um, and who are put off by, by any delays into the system. We asked, I asked the question in Wales recently um, following some work they'd done there, and actually they didn't feel that that had been an issue there, but they were aware of that as a potential issue. So um, with a different hat on, um, I'm a chair of an organ donation committee at my local hospital, so I am quite aware of the need to be able to make the ETS space available in order to, to, to go forward with a donation from a family. And that is something that, um, from my experience there and other hospitals, chief executives of trust uh, are very, very supportive of and understand. But we do, need to, we do need to be cognizant of the fact that this is something that, as we said earlier, is you know, it's not always planned at all. And those donations will take place often in the, in the middle of the night. So making surgical staff who are appropriately trained and, and adequate space available is really, really important. And I think that we, we just have to recognise that you've put some plans in place and to watch that very carefully to make sure we can continue to, to do the right thing here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Shabin? 
I would just like to to point out that actually that the, there needs to be proper training in in addition to the points that Fiona's made around the issues around capacity, because I think the um, the danger is that we think about the the capacity of the person who who is going to be the organ donor, and that there needs to be consideration proper consideration of the the capacity of the family who might be making a decision, who or disagreeing etc. or supporting this that. That, that there needs to be proper training for, for staff around that as well. Thank you very much. And Gordon. I mean, I just come back to my earlier point. I, I can't really comment on whether the, the government's planning in relation to the financial um, aspects of this is accurate or not, but or sufficient or not, but, but we would come back to the point that it would be better to use the resource which has been committed to this to in, in other ways, basically. Thank you very much. Can I say thank you to all of our witnesses once again uh, today? That's been very helpful to us all. Uh, as I said to the last panel, if there are questions to which you um, feel a further, further information would be helpful to the committee, feel free to let us have that after the event. And I will now uh, briefly suspend the meeting, and when we resume, we will be in private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>